Welcome back, everyone, to the seventh episode of Before the Tones Drop podcast, the best podcast on the Sioux City Fire Department. Today, we have a very special guest all the way from Council Bluffs. Making the drive is Rob Schoening. Rob is a 20-plus year veteran in the Council Bluffs Fire Department, as well as the he currently holds the rank of captain and the training officer. He's also a 20-plus year uh, service veteran serving in the active duty Army, uh, Army National Guard, and the Air National Guard. So, Rob, thank you for coming up today. We Heck appreciate yeah. you having us on. Yeah. And uh, welcome welcome to the podcast. Glad to be here. Thanks, fellas. How, how was the drive up today? It was beautiful. Weather was awesome. No crazy wind. I was able to stay awake the whole time, good, so that's good. Good deal. Good. And you, uh, what have you listened to so far? Um, I believe I from, listened from, from to podcast? five, six, and parts of three. Okay. The, the correct yeah. answer would be all, but you're doing great. All, okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 So you're doing great. All right. That's like close enough for horseshoes, hand grenades, and podcasts, right? What, uh, from an outside perspective, what do you think so far? I think it's awesome. The fact that you guys are just trying to share a little bit of the history of Sioux City, of course, the fire department, and um, just kind of get it jotted down so everybody can follow it, watch it, listen, see what's going on. I think it, I think it's pretty impressive. The fact that you've got administration to buy off and support it is is huge. Uh, let you guys get so much more done if you've got those guys in your in your corner so that's awesome oh for sure yeah we appreciate that you're our first outside guest outside of limblade but um in terms of another from another department and maybe that's something in the future we can expand on see if we can get guys from other departments and spread the word and build our little little bubble if you will so yeah i, th I think it's impressive that you drove up today we i mean we really like appreciate that because i thought we were doing the the phone and i was almost i was kind of excited to try the the call-in thing option on our on our soundboard to see how it went and then they're like oh no he's here and i'm like oh well that's awesome so yeah. good for you yeah, yeah, thank you very much for driving and yeah traveling and driving up for you know to be on the on the show yeah no problem all right rob where do you want to start you want to go all the way to the beginning go back to some high school days yeah we can do that um was uh you know between your military service and you know working for the fire department is that something you kind of always knew you wanted to do or where, where, so, where did that get where did that seed get planted? I didn't I didn't really have a big desire. I really didn't even know about paid firefighters. Every town that I always lived in, town city, even a California city of hundred plus thousand people, at that time they were volunteers. So I just kind of assumed that firefighters were always volunteer. Um, kind of always wanted to be I'm probably gonna get beat up by this, be careful. Uh, I always wanted to be a cop. <laughs> and uh, then I figured out that this was an option and went this route uh learned it's way better yeah yeah um <laughs> people are a little friendlier for the most part they're always happy to see us when we get here yeah uh high school i really I, I dabbled in sports but it was all recreational not for the school itself was mainly into uh skateboarding big skateboarder from nice. mid 80s up and through early 90s eventually when i graduated uh high school wasn't quite sure what i wanted to do so checked out a couple of different branches fought my way into the army they weren't going to let me in initially because i had a, a massive foot fracture um skateboarding incident moved in this nice. huge concrete bench it wasn't where we wanted it we were going to uh i don't want to say vandalize we were going to move this piece of equipment property that was somebody else's off this curb for some reason i decided that i was going to jump on the other side and catch this 500 plus pound bench <laughs> rolled onto my foot shattered my uh big toe the toe next to it had to get surgery was in a cast they put pins uh, all this good stuff. I went to join the army, and they're like, "Yeah, arthritis, all this other stuff. You can't mm -hmm. get in." Um, one thing led to another. Ended up kind of fighting my way in, going and seeing a bunch of different doctors so that they would let me enlist. Uh, signed up, left a couple days after I turned 19, and uh, started that whole process that way. Uh, more, more proof the army will take anyone. Anyone, yeah, they exactly. Really will. Jeez, yeah. yeah. If you really even, want. yeah, even, so, even broken people. If the army won't yeah. take you, yes, go next door to the Marine Corps. Right. I'll take yes. <laughs> yeah. So true. Uh, so what year was that? It was 19. I have 1994 here. Yeah. I graduated in 94, June of 94, enlisted in September of 94, delayed entry program, mm -hmm. uh, left January 3rd of 95. Active duty was going to be a medic, uh, left sunny Southern California. It was, you know, a day much like this, sun shining, beautiful blue skies, clouds, Went to San Diego, flew to St. Louis, got on a bus, drove to uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, stepped off the bus, looked up, it started snowing. <laughs> and I knew right then I was in for a beautiful eight weeks. Perfect. What, <laughs> so, what made you pick a medic? Uh, I kind of, 
I always had an interest in the medical field, uh, a little bit like we talked about before. For some reason, I had desire to learn CPR, and then it was a family friend that actually pointed me in that direction. We were chatting about plans after high school and such, and he just said, hey, Rob, you, you should uh, consider being a medic. I think you'd be a good medic. Yeah. I'm like, okay. That's, that's how the National Guard recruiter got me, because I was I wanted to be a firefighter, and they're like, well, don't do not do that. You need your EMT, go be a medic. And Of course. Was that slimy? Was that uh, straight through, or do you do a split, split enlistment? So that was a four-year enlistment. But I mean, was it like basic? You did your basic and then Fort Sam, yep. Houston after right, yeah. like right after for your AIT, or did yep. you split it? Okay, so that was uh, January, February, March in Missouri. As soon as I left there, went uh, jumped on a bus, drove straight to Fort Sam, knocked that out. I think I graduated in June, went straight from there to beautiful Fort Polk, Louisiana. Yeah, nice. and uh, <laughs> which it's a lovely place. Yeah. <laughs> so, so a little background on Fort Polk. I mean, um, if you're there training, it may not be the best place in the world, but you were there, you were stationed there. You were, I was. you were there to help train the units come there to train right. for their readiness. We'll, it, so kind of talk about that. Even if you're stationed there, Fort Polk is still not the best place in the world. <laughs> so, uh, probably the big thing on, on Fort Polk is a uh, huge training facility for guys going to Vietnam. They would, they'd go to basic AIT, uh, infantry school, boom, head off to Vietnam. So uh, really cool history there. Lots of humidity, lots of rain, lots of swamp mm-hmm. stuff. So conditions were similar to what they were trying to prep guys for in Vietnam. Uh, Fort Polk, the unit that I was at, JRTC, Joint Readiness Training Center, it's an airborne infantry unit. It's a battalion-sized element there. And departments, or I'm sorry, units kind of pick what it is that they want to do. So, for example, if they want to defend against an airborne operation, we would jump in. If they want to do helicopter assaults, we would do that. Um, still very similar now, but they've adopted a lot of the things they've get they've got from Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, other places as far as conventional garb for that area mm-hmm. and everything else. But we used to dress. I mean, we had horses, we had motorcycles. I would you'd go on uh, relaxed grooming standards. You grow beards, goatees, shave right your heads, wear civilian clothes, and then we'd go out do recon and then sneak into these places at night in civilian clothes and pretty much harass them yeah very so, cool out four yeah. is way better than having oh. to be the, the the people training yeah if you have structure if you have four you have no rules right exactly do it no rules want. and we had a lot of fun with that that's awesome create chaos and yeah i so, love that totally wow. so you spent about three four years then in fort polk yep and then you decided to make a transition from there you decided to get out come home what mm-hmm. t- talk us through that process I wanted to stay in, but I couldn't get anything that I wanted. I wanted to go to flight medic school, uh, a couple other things. I wasn't really sure. Things were a little up in the air, so I decided to uh, get out, try to knock out college. Came home. Uh, By then, my family had moved back to Iowa from California. So I came here. Um, One thing led to another. I immediately started school, knocked out my associates, jumped into Bellevue University, and the goal was to... uh, try to get my bachelor's done, consider a master's program, see what shook out from there. I always had an inter- interest in going to either PA school or med school, but I don't really dig math or science. <laughs> yeah, <that's... laughs> and you know, those are kind of important things. Yeah, yeah. Minor uh, details. That's... Yeah, yeah, no, nothing too crazy. Uh, the fire department thing happened by accident. I was an EMT in 1995 when you went to the medic school, you could if your scores were high enough, you could challenge the registry. But oh, okay. otherwise, nobody was that. yeah nobody was national registered. In '98, I wanted to go to EMT school, so the unit sent me to EMT school as a four week full time class. Knocked that out, held that certification, got out, and then uh, I went to the LURS unit down in Nebraska, which was in Crete. Uh, they were the only airborne unit that was close by, so I went down there, wanted to check it out. Got to, got to chatting with the guy, and he says. Hey, you're in, you're a medic. I said, yeah. He said, you have your EMT. I said, yeah. He said, uh, you should check out one of the fire departments. We're taking applications. And I'm like, what, what's the fire department? You know, I mean, that's <laughs> right. how ignorant wow. I was and all yeah. that. And he kind of explained it to me. And of course, the big hook is, oh, you work, you know, 10, 24 hour shifts. You got the rest of the time off and, you know, decent, decent starting pay. And I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. One thing led to another, uh, applied, uh, had a little bit of, uh, kind of like getting into the military, a little bit of a challenge getting on the fire department, fire department, because as you guys know, you have your EMT, 
you go to renew every March 31st with your national registry. My registry was good. I didn't have the card back yet. And when I went to apply at the fire department, they said, hey, you, you can't apply because you don't have a card. I said, well, I, I, I'm registered. I just don't have the new card yet. After uh, talking to city hall, the city attorney, human resources, the fire chief, all these different people, finally they're like, okay, hey, we'll let you apply. And uh, I did scored well enough to make the list and got on. Yeah, and you, you, you talked earlier when we did our pre-meeting that the way you handled yourself in that process actually kind of helped you in the long run because you, you handled it professionally, you kind of got to know some people, and then they were they were just really impressed that you worked really hard to kind of make something happen for yourself. You were you were essentially told no, and you didn't roll over and take that wall try again later. You kind of made your own luck. And yeah. being professional about it, that was probably the biggest help, right? Just yeah. Being yeah, decent was, about it. Yeah, that was huge. And and. It's one of those deals. I was probably told no half a dozen times, like, no, it can't happen. And I'm like, uh, there's got to be a way. And so, again, just trying to uh, get all that information across while being cool helped without a doubt. Sure. Yeah. And at that time, how many people were applying for Council Bluffs Fire? I'm going to say probably 150 to 200 ish, somewhere in there. Sure. But what, what was nice about it is, hey, I, I did all that. By then, the chief has called me on my own phone at home. You know, we didn't have cell phones back then. Um, I go to do the written test. When I walk in, the chief knows me by first name. Yeah. yeah hey, Rob, how you doing? And yeah. all that good stuff. So it, it actually was a pretty, pretty big help. Yeah. Good. Good deal. I, I, I think that's just a great, great advice for anyone, anyone trying to get into this service right now or the young, you know, the younger crowd is you're going to get told no. You're going to get, this is kind of a hard process. It can be challenging. A lot of it is making your own luck, creating your own opportunities, staying persistent, and then you know really not taking your failures and let them just overall defeat you. It's how you come back from them. You're going to fail a written test. You're going to fail interviews. Okay, what do we do from there? And don't just take no for an answer. Really, really fight back from that adversity. Yeah, big time. I mean, how about, I applied on Council Bluffs, got on the first time. That is not the norm. And, uh, I mean, I don't know about you guys. First time, I know, second department. Second department, but first list. Okay. Yeah. 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 And, and for me, this was the first one and kind of had a similar -ish experience. I went to basic training. I remember graduating basic training and I, I said, I knew I wanted to be a firefighter. My, I remember my mom sent me a cutout of the, the job posting in the Sioux City Journal. And I remember, oh, that's pretty cool. And then I was like, I remember when I graduated, I was like, well, there's still three days left of the application. And I spent my family day at a hotel computer, like putting it in online and calling HR to see if this was possible. And they're like, yeah, we'll make it work. And so some Saturday in the fall, I was, when I was at Fort Sam Houston, Texas, they emailed me the test, or they sent me the test. I had to track down an E7 on his weekend to uh, administer, administer the test for me. And then when I graduated and came home, there was one more CPAT iteration. I didn't have a practice or anything. I just had to come in and take it. Thankfully, I was in pretty good shape coming out of uh, AIT training. And yeah, had that not happened, I don't know where, where that would have led me. Yeah, it would have delayed things by a couple years for sure. So. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, this creativity part. Phil, is this your first? Were you on the first time? Yeah, no, and yeah, I feel fortunate. I was moved six hundred miles from home, but I was kind of not not necessarily a little bit kind of the same kind of thing for you as as far as the injuries thing and stuff like that going. I was at Creighton University. I'm a full on a full Army ROTC scholarship, uh, and going to be uh, for nursing and stuff, and hopefully to go on anesthesia once I went active duty. But uh, broke my tib fib. Uh, playing air mail sports down there and then had a year off for uh, for medical at the finally at the last let my last doctor's appointment up until for you know yep we're gonna get it fixed I mean I had I had uh, uh, complications with it uh, multiple surgeries infection all kinds of stuff but everything was like no we're gonna get you fixed you'll be fine by very last appointment before I was gonna get medically cleared to go back to ROTC and go to do that stuff the, the doc was pretty much like well for all practical purposes in life, you'll you'll be fine. But he's like, you'll the military will never take well, they won't take it back. You'll never hike five miles with seventy pounds on your back and stuff. You're like, won't take it, you know. So I'm like, dude, like this is like this was my plan. This was like, hmm. you know, uh, ROTC commission career, you know, uh, career army and do all this stuff, and then to have that all of a sudden like, well, yeah, it's not going to work anymore. Um, so with that, went you know went back home. But then I got on a BLS ambulance service, uh, met a good buddy that uh, kind of got me into interest in fire service stuff, which it's always one of those things as I was a little kid that I've always wanted to be a firefighter. Or it was always a cool thing, you know. Um, and uh, but then and I wanted to stay in my hometown, work as a fire medic, which there you had to be. You had to have your paramedic. 
Um, and then, you know, you'll get your fire training and stuff, but you had to be a fire medic there. And I thought that that's kind of like you, where you're like, you thought all firefighters were volunteer. To me, like, you had to be a fire medic to be a firefighter outside of, like, New York or Chicago or something really big, right? right. Well, not realizing that you can get a job as a firefighter, just, just as a firefighter in other places. So i um, waiting for the community college in town to get, because this was about the same time you were coming on here as in 99. Um, 99, 2000, right, when the paramedic program was going from a certificate certification program to a degree program, community college in town was having a hard time getting the uh, curriculum established. So in the meantime, I'm like, dude, you know, waiting and waiting and waiting. I'm like, I need a job. I need to do something. So um, went online, dial up, dial up Internet, you know, like firejobs.com. Um, found Sioux City at the time. Sioux City was the closest to home that was accepting applications. So sent it in, and that was in, must have been 2000, 2001 or something, because I got hired in 02. Okay. Um, and it came down here. So, um, but the same kind of thing, you know, kind of, you know, it's that course of cor- correction and where you kind of find out that oh, I could get a job. I already had my EMT because I was working as an EMT, and I didn't need to be a paramedic to get a job as a firefighter. That's like just taken. But at that time, it was Sioux City at that time was. You had to have your EMT when you applied, yep. when you took the <clears throat> test. So my, and, and I don't know, you have to share what, how many people showed up to take your test, but they were going to take, I was wearing, like, they're taking the top 50 after the written, right? I show up, 36 people to, to show up to take the test wow. when, I, when I tested. 36 people. So all you had to do was pass a written I test. Know. I actually ended, ended up sitting next to um, Jason Siegel, which was funny because, um, didn't, you know, didn't know the guy, met him the first time. He was from Duluth, Minnesota. I'm from Virginia, Minnesota. It was an hour, hour north of Duluth. He was from Duluth. So, like, two guys from the same area ended up sitting next to each other, Tessa, Sioux City. He actually got hired the same time I did. He left about uh, eight, nine months into probation. He's actually a captain in Duluth now. But okay. um, but it was just, yeah, it's kind of a, a small world. But, yeah, 36 people to, to show up to take the test. When yeah, that's pretty wild. Life, so, this this yeah. wasn't Hollywood actor Jason Siegel? No, it was not. Different guy. Different guy. <laughs> I didn't know he was a firefighter. Yeah. Getting kind of a cart head of the horse here with the advice stuff, but it's all good stuff. I, I love it. Uh, basically, that's good advice for life in general, though. You're going to have failures. I think now the younger generation, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, though, are you so used to instant gratification that they don't make that first list. They're done. They're moving on to something else or working a crappy job, job to job, hopping yeah. city to city, town to town, doing whatever. You guys – got told no, you know, thought that was the path you were taking, but then all of a sudden here comes this other path sprouting from the no's or failures, but really not really a failure looking now, right? Right, totally. But So you don't know what's going to happen. None of us are know know what's going to happen. You can have a plan in your head. Me, I was going to get hired here. This is where I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. Well, not getting called, not getting called. Better start looking other places, huh? Yeah, yeah, totally. Create your own own path, yeah. So – Take the test at Fort Dodge Fire. I go, man, I'm just I'm just here to be here. Yeah. You know? End up getting hired. Loving it. Absolutely loved it there. Was still on this list, thankfully, because it mm-hmm. hadn't expired yet. But, man, that was a hard decision. Mm-hmm. Thinking this is all I had in my mind to do. You know, this is what I was going to do. I was going to do anything possible to do it. Well, ended up here, thankfully, and it's been great. But that was a hard path to stray from because it wasn't the initial one that I thought it was going to be, but it ended up being one I loved. So yeah. just like encouragement to people out there that yeah. Take you the think test. you might have it all figured out, but guess what? None of right. us do. So. And, well, and all of us have kind of really, for the most part, are, are in the minority as far as taking a test, making the list the first time and getting hired off of your first hiring very list. Cool. That, right. is, yeah. that is a very, and I, and I will tell anybody that I'm fortunate for that, that yes. that was, you know, that was the case because I know guys, there's a lot of guys that are on our job that have taken the test, you know, taken the test and made the list multiple times before they got hired mm-hmm. or have taken, or there's guys that we know that have made multiple lists and have not gotten hired. So, you know, I, I mm-hmm. you know, feel very fortunate and, and, and give thanks every day that, you know, the first list and get hired, you know, uh, a year into that list. So, um, but yeah, we're all kind of in that situation, but yeah, it is good advice to anybody that, that is taking the test is to not get discouraged. If you sit on that hiring list and you're not getting called and not getting called and you don't that first time take it again, because, you know, eventually things, things do happen, but you can't, you can't just, you know, write it off and be like, Oh, well, didn't work out. So I guess that's it. We, that, we had a guy in my class. He's still on the job with me. I want to say he applied eight times. Wow. His wow, grandpa was man. on CB. Yeah. Uh, his dad was on CB. He, end up, he ends up getting hired, and it's kind of like, oh, nobody should say anything because, hey, 
TC's been here a whole bunch, and he's been trying, and he wants it really, really bad. And, it, I mean, that's awesome to see. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's amazing. So. You, want, you want to talk about your son? Your son just yeah. got hired on Wichita Fire. You're kind of So he went through this process really recently, and the right. advice you've given him and such. Yeah, so my I've got I've got two boys, um, Jack and Sam. Jack's uh, 19, Sam's 16. And Jack applied, let's see here, he applied to Omaha, Lincoln, Sioux City, Wichita, I want to say either Fremont or Bennington. Mm-hmm. Uh, so a bunch of departments. He ends up getting an interview on Lincoln, but I, th- I think they interview everybody the first time. Uh, with Sioux City, I know he was up here this last one. Uh, he was in in the group that passed, going to move on. One thing led to another. Somebody says, hey, you should go check out Wichita. He applies to Wichita. Wichita does a unique process on, as far as, hey, you show up, do the physical. Um, mile and a half run, then roughly what I, I'll call the firefighter challenge. Knock out both those things, immediately roll into a kitchen table type interview. And uh, if they like what they're seeing and their scores are good and everything checks out, they'll offer you a job right there, which they did. Wow. And I, I thought that was a little rushed. And the, the more I chatted with him, I believe he said they interviewed 200 plus people to finally pick 20 wow. for the oh, class wow. that he was in. Wow. Uh, he started the academy. He spent the night, did a little bit of uh, physical fitness, or sorry, not physical fitness, but the, the physical portions that he had to knock out like the next day. So they were super accommodating. And, and a lot of times, I think people think that's just the small departments that can be that agile. Mm-hmm. It's pretty impressive to see Wichita, a, a large department like that, 450 plus people, um, able to move that like yeah. that to get that wow. stuff knocked out. So he ends up getting on Wichita, knocks out the academy, does, I believe it's a eight to ten week academy there. Mm-hmm. Graduated in February, and is uh, riding Engine 18 with an awesome crew down there. Good what part him. of town's that in? West. Very, I, th- I believe it's the furthest west station okay. in in that uh, in that area. So yeah. for for him getting on, is he like so comes out the academy assigned to a company? Is that like I mean, could he end up spending his whole career then at that high house, or does he get bumped around, or what is? So they, and I don't want to speak for Wichita. I think they're they're kind of changing some of the diff- some of the things they do. I believe they run they were running four shifts mm. and they had what was called a D shift, which guys kind of floated. They've now eliminated that shift. They're running just three shifts. Um, he's on C shift, and he can move, but I believe he's pretty much been at that station since February with uh, with awesome. his crew, which is cool. awesome. Yeah. That uh, Wichita, I know, got a huge safer grant. They're allowed to hire a whole bunch of guys. They're getting wow. new rigs and stations. Uh, I believe they're getting a truck at his station. I think it, uh, it arrived this week. He's up here for guards right okay. now. Uh, so he wasn't at work uh, Sunday when that, either Friday or Sunday, the rig was going to roll in. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. So, Because your son, he grew up fast too. He's 17 years old, goes in the guard, does a split train for basic training. So he spends his junior to senior year, he spends that summer going to basic training instead of, you know, all the fun things kids can do in the summer. Yep. Goes, does his senior year, then leaves for Fort Sam Houston, goes, becomes a medic. So he gets his EMT through the Army National Guard. Mm-hmm. And then right there, he's 18 years old and, yeah. and he's ready to move on. You know, people are freshmen, and college still trying to figure stuff out and he's ready for the real world right and yeah. i can kind of relate to that i started this when i was 20 shipper you started really young too yeah 20. so in yeah. having but having a mentor really helps with that process mm-hmm. if you don't have it it can take you a few years to kind of figure out how this whole thing works so i'm sure having you really really helped guide him along that path I find myself to be a rarity in itself because I didn't do any military before. That was always an option for me as well, have some military in my family. But that's a common theme, kind of. Obviously, we're listening. Your son was military. He's on Wichita. I'm sure they have a handful or not, probably a ton of military guys Mm -hmm. down there, bigger department. But military guys sitting basically with everyone in the room here, you know. But that's just a common theme, again, in the fire service. It's an easy transition for those military guys, kind of, isn't it? Yeah. For yourself, was it? I think it's one of those deals where, and I I don't want to get, I know know we've got stuff we're working on, but one of the things I told him was he he always had an interest in the fire service because of of me. Mm -hmm. Um, I probably, I didn't have an interest in the fire service because I didn't nobody know anyone that was in the fire service. So early on, he's always, you know, I mean, we joke, we used to call him Pockets because (laughs) he would come up here to drill and he always had like, you know, we always had all these like handouts and everything else. And he'd have his pockets jammed full of stuff. And so they jokingly called him pockets. But so I always knew, eh, he's quite possibly going to go with the military. His uh, interest in the fire service was huge. He joined the volunteer department at 16 as a cadet. Cool. Um, 
I ended up joining with him, and so that that's pretty cool to be able to run run calls with with uh, with anybody in your family. Um, he wanted to do the military thing, and and the big thing I told him was, I'm like, hey, dude, check it out. You're going to be 18 as an EMT, trying to get on a fire department. Like, why would anybody hire you? Yeah. And so I said, and my advice to young guys would be, you need to seek out every opportunity for education and experience, mm-hmm. and that can come from anywhere. I mean, hey, cleaning bathrooms at McDonald's. Is, is huge. Like, if you can word that the right way on the responsibility and everything else that goes with it, you can get education experience anywhere and everywhere. Mm-hmm. So that was one thing I always pushed him to do. Um, and, and same thing with, with uh, my youngest one, Sam. Uh, we go do firearms competitions. Well, everybody knows giving a speech is the scariest thing in the world. Well, hey, now I'm going to hand a 14-year-old a handgun, and he's going to shoot in front of a, a bunch of grown men, and they're going to be watching and seeing what he does. So it's the, it's the same type of deal. Uh, education experience anywhere and everywhere you can get it is, is, is huge. And then, of course, being able to articulate that uh, in a job interview yeah. so they know if they should take a chance on you. Yeah. I think the military kind of validates that you at least can have some res- understanding of responsibility, taking orders, doing all yeah. that stuff. It gives you a strong foundation. And then even if you're probably lacking a little bit, the fire department has a good way of of teaching you to grow up as well. Oh, totally. I mean, I'm sure yeah. if I could see myself first day of probation, 20 years old, I'd be like, well, geez, like, I want to slap that kid. Yeah. Um, but I did too. The, 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 <laughs> fire, the fire service has a way of, you know, they, they, we, they, they taught me to grow up. They taught me to be a man. I learned how to do finances through this job. I learned how to buy a house. I learned how to do everything I know to do it today as an adult between the military and the fire department. Mm-hmm. And I'll, you know, I'll give my parents a little bit of credit too, but it, that's that's what this job does. So it, it is good for for young people because they have mentors they can look up to and show them how to do stuff, show them how to be an adult and live life. Yeah, going back to the the create the creativity thing. I mean, all of us had little unique stories on how we got to the department where we are. I think the fire department is this huge melting pot of all these creative folks. And ultimately, yeah. in the end, or at the, at the end of the day, we have to get creative with some of those calls. Uh, and think outside the box, and all that bleeds over into our, our normal life, and uh, that's why we're we're trying to share with our, our brothers how to get creative with buying a house and stock and yeah, stocks absolutely. and bonds and well, yeah, NFTs just, and all this good stuff. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, you find this it, the level of diversity that's in the fire service as far as the the origins of how guys got here, how they grew up. Um, you know everything. I mean, you you find so much, and you do have, yeah. have guys that have been through pretty much anything that you could have gone through as far as life experiences and stuff, and highs and lows, and what worked and what different didn't work and stuff. So yeah, you can get advice from pretty much any, you know, and take it for what you want. I mean, some advice is going to be really good, and some you know maybe not so much. But um, but I mean, for yeah, for a young guy, you know, you guys, you know, twenty, I was twenty one, you know, coming on and. Um, you know, it's you do you you do learn a lot. And there's those mentors. You know, Al Kinsey was one that like to you know come on with with and have Al when I was on probation. It was huge for any of that kind of stuff. You know that we all kind of know that he play, was a keystone down there at, at threes for many years for us at um, to learn those things. But yeah, it's there's always somebody who's got that's good at something or you know, and then beyond that, you know, it's it's people that you know know how to fix things or you know, work on cars or build stuff or whatever you know it's just it's it's the, so diverse like you said it's a good way to explain it. it's like a melting pot or like a big wad of play-doh of different colors that you smash into one thing that somehow it all works when it gets smashed together even though mm-hmm. everything is it mm-hmm. comes from like different different places you know exactly yeah. so again kind of back track on your career rap uh so you get hired in 02 you want to kind of talk about your first year through the academy and being a young probie, you know, a young guy in the job? Yeah. Uh, we had a, as far as I can remember, Council Bluff's been, or I should say, as far as I know, Council Bluff's been running an academy in one form or another for many, many years. So even 20 plus years ago, we had an eight week academy. Go in there, knock all that stuff out, come out, get assigned to an engine or a truck, do so much time on there. Usually it was, it was about a year, and then you jump over to one of the medic units, knock out the academy, go online. Uh, it was kind of, had a pretty exciting first day. Uh, morphine overdose. We had a car wreck uh, that with patients had to transport them. I can't remember what the other one was. And then we had a house fire that night that was working Man. fire. So it was, it was great. And I, it was, this is one of, one of those things you're all pumped up. Yes, first day on the job, we get a fire. Everything's great. And I actually said that to a lady that was outside of this house that was on fire. <laughs> and it, it, 
I just I just rolled off my tongue. I'm like, oh, awesome day. It's the first day and we got a house fire. And she said something to the effect of, well, that was somebody's house. And I'm like, oh, yeah. You know, just one of those perspective, things. Perspective, though. Yeah, right? perspective. perspective. So it's one of those deals. I'm like, hey, this is, we love going to fires, but we, we try not to say that out loud yeah. because, you know, it's uh, one of those deals. Hey, ultimately, they're trying to make a bad situation better. That's, that's what um, we want to do. And we're excited that we get that opportunity to uh, help these people. But yeah, big house fire that night. It, it was cool. There were, I think, I think we had three probies in headquarters that night. And next morning we get up, and we've all got black cat stickers on our, oh, yeah. on our helmets, which was, you know, pretty, pretty cool deal. Um, what's what's the black cat sticker? How's so eh, you're kind of you know bad luck. Oh, okay. In, in yeah, the black cat. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I get yeah. what you're saying. He's a little yeah. slow. Yeah. I didn't know uh, if that was like a, you know there's some like people who get piles thing. of something else on their helmet because they're a little bit I mean with a yeah. magnet over the top. Uh, um, so yeah, it was it was good good first day. It was awesome and first year jumped around did a couple different rigs. I'm going to a Hazmat Tech School that first year and eventually you know just normal work stuff. Awesome. So you said you came in in 2002. So did you did you leave? So you left active duty in the military before, and then you came to yep. Council Bluffs. But you still have a tie to the guard, though, yeah. Correct. Yeah. So okay. I ETSed. Uh, it would have been late 98. So I just say 99. Enlisted. I was going to stay out, and as soon as I got out, of course, I had missed it. I wished you know was back in doing that stuff. So I joined the guard. Joined the Iowa Air Guard uh, down in Council Bluffs, and so still do still there doing all that stuff, and that's how I ended up finding the, the department. I was, I know that the state will whatever state you're in will pay for college yes. for for that state. So knocked out my associates in Iowa. As soon as I got done with that, I was going to go to Bellevue in Nebraska, mm-hmm. and uh, so I had to find a Nebraska unit. That's why I ended up at the Long Range Surveillance Detachment across the river, and that's where I bumped into a buddy that told me about the fire department. Okay, so then how did you, so, but you're still, but you're on at the 185th up here? Uh, That, so I ended up doing four years active, seven years Army Guard. Okay. And I was uh, Iowa, Nebraska, Illinois. Okay, on the Army side. Yep, yep, on the Army side. Okay. And then uh, we've got a handful of dudes that are on Council Bluffs that were on the 185th at that time. Mm -hmm. And they're like, hey, you should join the 185th. Um, So I decided to call up, check that out. Yeah. It was great opportunity so i jumped on that one did that, that was, to uh, go from army to air guard did that feel like a downgrade <laughs> <laughs> yes i have a lot of friends in the air guard no, <laughs> hey, air, air guard was yeah. uh, it was awesome yeah the what what's so cool about the air guard is those guys are ready to deploy right now all the time they're always ready to go and and they are going all the time i don't it's because they're always sending i don't want to say ones and ones and twosies but they're sending a small group of people all the time. There's always somebody deployed from the 185th. That was one thing I loved about it. They had shorter deployments, and they went right now all the, all the time. Mm-hmm. If you weren't deployable, hey, we got a lot of people that are trying to get in the Air Guard, so, hey, if you don't want to be here and can't meet the standard, thank you for playing. Yeah, mm-hmm. cool. And so then you finished out your 20 years. You said 20, 22 years, correct? Yep, a little over 22. And you finished that out in the 185th? Is yep. that where you retired out of? Yeah, so I, I came to the uh, – Air Guard in May of 2006, went right to the fire department. Right about that time, they were getting ready to deploy to Iraq, I think, for the first time. I had to knock out. One thing that was nice is the DOD Fire Academy took all my certifications from Council Bluffs. So they took everything except I needed one school to deploy, which was the uh, ARF Crash Crash Fire Rescue Course. course. And at that time, we had a couple guys that went to a one-week. Well, I was going to have to go to the two-week DOD Academy, so I didn't get to get on that first trip to uh, Iraq with the guys. Knocked out, uh, went to the DOD Fire Academy. Uh, this was always kind of, it was kind of funny. I asked how I need to go about that whole process. Like, hey, take all your certs, go down to Texas, walk in. You're going to start day one like everybody else. And then as soon as I start asking people for paperwork, just raise your hand and say, hey, I've got all these certs. And they'll let you skip the academy. I'm like, you want me to pack up, take all my stuff and go down here and I'm just supposed to walk in and do that? They're like, yeah. I'm like, Okay. This is different than the army, which is sure. the, the opposite of how the army works. Yeah, the totally. Army is so that's why I was kind of like, eh, all right, I'll, I'll roll the dice. So I did just that. Had all my certs. They start taking paperwork. I just raised my hand. Hey, Sergeant, uh, Sergeant Shoning, I've got all these certs from the DoD Fire Academy that say I'm allowed to skip to the the last block of instruction. Like, ah, 
yeah, let's, let's go talk to this dude, this dude. So we stand up, take my paperwork in, hand it off. They look some things over and say, awesome. Uh, they dropped me into the last two weeks of the DOD Fire Academy so that I could get the crash fire rescue portion knocked out. Perfect. Nice. And it was, that's a weird transition because these guys have all been together for, I want to say that's like a four-month course. And I'm walking in the last two weeks as an outcast. I'm like, sorry, guys, hate to break up your party. I'm just yeah. here to ride this out. Exactly. Wow. So what, uh, how many deployments did you end up doing throughout your whole career? Uh, I just did one de- one deployment. It was a short one to Kuwait uh, with a whole bunch of it was awesome awesome deployment we had paid guys there from houston fdny oh sioux city council bluffs and then i want to say we had uh full-time firefighters from a handful of other bases west virginia a couple of a couple other spots cool so very huge crazy crew of uh guys from all over the place managing those guys oh my goodness yeah (laughs) We, we we get to kuwait we had two stations stood up um i was just ecstatic to finally be deployed and this, I got asked to run dispatch I'm like I have no idea how to run dispatch <laughs> uh sure just yeah, tell me sure, what I'll buttons to push um I think it was like the very first call I dispatched it was for an unexploded ordinance that they found well I'm just like hey I just want to give guys a heads up so I'm like hey heads up uh, we have an unexploded ordinance coming in well that sounds like incoming we've got incoming. Uh, mortar incoming. fire coming in yeah. so I'm like after the fact I'm like Awesome job. You know? <laughs> so, but it was fun, you know, seeing that side of uh, the fire department. Uh, did that, had fun doing that, and then then went on a rig and rode a rig for the rest of the rest of the trip. Good deal. So, very doing cool. twenty two years, and you know, a very a lot of those years doing both CB and the guard. Can you talk about some of the challenges that you faced, or maybe some advice to other guard people that are also in the fire service and managing managing the guard, managing your job here, and having that work work guard relationship. Yeah, it, it is definitely a challenge. I think the biggest the biggest part of that is, you know, the fire department all in all is super supportive of guys being on military orders and doing that. And uh, I think the the military side is also supportive. It's it's hugely beneficial when it's at a fire department. So w- with one eighty fifth, we could do twenty four hour shifts if we wanted to. You kind of manage that a little bit better so that you didn't disrupt life at home or life on council bluffs. Mm-hmm. The the big, the big thing is just open communication, trying to tell the chain of command, like, hey, Cap, I've, I've, I've got this coming up, or there's this school, what, whatever else the case may be, trying to share all of that with them while not abusing that. Mm. Because, I mean, the military, especially the 185th, we could stay deployed or go to as many schools as we, as we wanted to all the time. DOD Fire Academy has every school known to man. If you want to go, they'll send you. Mm-hmm. And you don't want to abuse that, yet at the same time, it's DOD Fire Academy is an incredible place. If you can go there, you should go. So just it's really just a matter of balance, yeah. and got to communicate that up the chain of command on both sides, military side and the fire side, so that uh, guys know what you want to do and everything else. And, and then you mentioned last time being an ambassador for both. When you're at guard representing the fire department, it's like oh, that guy's that guy scored away. He must have good people over there. And then the same thing, vice versa, representing the guard well. That way you don't. You create a good name for future people that might be in your situation, and it's never it's never fun. It doesn't matter what job you're in for your employer to have to to have to have you be gone because you're off doing training. But that's kind of the reality of things. Yeah. And it's it's huge. I mean, you but there is a right way to do it. You're totally representing every member of the military when you're out, and you're representing hey, ever not only your department but all firefighters everywhere. Yeah. I, I mean, I kind of tell this. It's really one of those deals when we're out driving around. Hey, if I'm if I'm wearing a Sioux City Fire shirt. And I'm acting, acting like a jackass to somebody somewhere. Somebody always knows someone, and it's going to get back around. We, we should be trying to do the right thing all the time. Even but when no one's looking. All, That's yeah, a big always, one. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone can do it while everyone's looking, but right. not yeah. being a total turd when all the eyes are off you or you think because there's yeah. always someone there's watching someone like someone you said. Yeah. Always. Well, always. Always. Yeah. You know, it's always that, that, you know, the funny thing about firemen is night or day, they're always firemen. It doesn't matter. You right. will always be, once you're on a fire department and stuff, you know, you will always be recognized as a firefighter first. Yep. Then, you know, before anything else. So. I, th- I think that one thing on the, on the military and military side, you have to remember if you're if you're a firefighter and you're wearing that uniform and we're on greens this day, uh, we just got to make sure that we're doing the right thing to represent the fire department, keep them in the loop, being a good member of that department. And then as soon as we switch off, we got to do the same thing. Uh, some guys do a phenomenal job of that. Some guys could use some work. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
it's kind of a tough conversation to have sometimes like hey like are you doing the best thing for both places correct but conversation needs to take place yeah yeah sure yeah. no I, I would baker probably has the numbers but i think we're over a third or a third former military and then i probably got 15 to 20 currently in the guard right now i think that's yeah. a little high but yeah balancing that's important what about what about the benefits of you know military service whether you former active duty or being in the guard and how what you learn there makes you a better firefighter and what how being a better being on the fire department helps be a better guardsman i know that when we went from went from council bluffs and deployed to kuwait there were certain things that we did right away that i tried to implement from council bluffs and share with those guys because the unique thing all civilian fire department i don't want to say all the large majority of civilian fire departments are going to be busier than a lot of the military fire departments. And same thing on the medical side. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is it, on the military side, most of the people that you're working on, at me as a medic, they're 18 to 40-ish. Uh, they're in shape because they get time to work out, and it's, you know, check. There's a standard. Yeah. And if there's something wrong medically, <clears throat> guess what? Hey, hey, bail, right? So really on the, on the medical side, unless it's an accident or we're at war, uh, you don't get a lot of patient time unless it's just, you know, whatever. I think about uh, different calls that I ran on sick call. It's like, hey, toenailectomy, sutures from somebody <laughs> bashing their head on something, whatever the case may be. Fire, civilian fire department stays way busier than a military fire department. On the opposite side of that would be military gets all kinds of time for training, which is great. So you can kind of steal both from each. You can steal something from both places and apply it to the other side. I know taking, uh, you know, for example, fire inspector down at the DOD, DOD Fire Academy, then bringing it back, it at least gave me some reference uh, for that specific subject when Good. I wanted to do it on CB. What about from the leadership standpoint? As you moved up in rank, learning to manage other soldiers and other airmen, how did that help you as you went through your career in, in Council Bluffs, being a lieutenant and a captain, managing your firefighters? I was super fortunate. The first unit I was in, uh, the 509th down there at GRTC, I had incredible NCOs in that place. And I would say they challenged all NCOs after that point. And the big thing was they, we did counseling initially. We did counseling every month. We did counseling anytime there was a change. I always felt like I knew what they wanted, uh, what they expected. I knew where to go if I had questions, et cetera. So it was constant uh, sharpening on, in that regard. I love that. Easily, one of the, one of the biggest impacts I had uh, came from that place. The other thing was, they're like, hey, uh, hey Ben, how long have you been here? Uh, I've been here an hour, sorry, okay, awesome. How long have you been here? Uh, I've been here two hours, awesome. Guess what, you're in charge, go get this done. Hmm. So they threw you in that leadership position right away because I, I think they understood that being an air, infantry unit, the, yeah. the possibility exists that, hey, you're getting hit and you need to step up. So it was always one of those deals of teach the guy above you or teach the guy below you your job because something could happen and you no, you no longer there. I think that applies to the fire department big time in the sense that, hey, a vehicle could, could easily come through the accident scene and guess who's standing there? The probie. Mm -hmm. Now the probie's got to make radio traffic, do all that stuff, uh, get everybody coming there while managing the scene and all those other things. So if, if we don't share that, uh, we kind of set them up for failure. So you so, always talk about training your replacement. Yeah, big time. You know, so And, yeah, and not in the sense that this guy's going to take my job. No, but, but that yeah. you, you know, you're not doing, you know, especially as, as officers and stuff, we get in that position where we're not, if we're not preparing our people to make that next step, or even, you know, was a driver to not train that third firefighter to be a good driver and an right. officer not train, you know, you're yeah. Not that I want you to take my job, but I'm not doing my job if I'm not preparing you to, to make that next step. Right. You know? And that's, and you know, we, we talk about how, you know, you said that sharpening, which I, I kind of like, but how, you know, by, by, you getting that that all that constant input and stuff like that from somebody above you sharpens you but then you're performing which sharpens them and, and together you know you know that you can't necessarily improve yourself by yourself that you need somebody in that critic you know the, the criticism and then and the stuff to come in but that two people together can you know really uh help themselves perform at a higher level and stuff so we're, yeah. we're constantly doing that so yeah the, the, like that. the whole you can call it a mentor you can call it a coach whatever it should be, I mean, we should be doing that constantly. And I, that's what I pulled from that, that first unit. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, I always looked for that afterwards. And some places hit it, some didn't. Uh, what, was, what was super blessed that I had that as my first unit because the standard had been set. And I'm like, okay, cool, this is what I'm going to, if I don't get it, I'm going to seek it out. 
and, and so on. Yeah. So being able to be able to steal that from uh, the military side and then apply it to the, uh, the fire department side, it's challenging because it's a little bit different. But if we go back to, hey, really those guys were mentors and coaches, I should be able to do the same thing on the fire department side. And really I'm sharing information. Sure. I'm trying to make those guys as the best they can possibly be. That being said, do you believe that some people are meant to lead and some people are meant to follow for sure then? I hate to say that, but I think there are I'm just people throwing general yeah, statements. Yeah, out. No, you know, I, I don't want to blanket. Everything. There are definitely people that do a better job, right? Sure. With, without a doubt, with little prompting. Um, so yes. Yeah. Okay. I like that. Uh, it was my, I was on, it was my third year on the department was when I did my deployment and I felt like even though I was gone and I really, you know, I, that is unfortunate for my employer. I came back a better person. And the skills I learned on deployment, that experience, made me better in the long run. Now that I can, for the next 30 years, for the rest of my career here in the fire department, I benefited from. And I just, mm-hmm. that, that's what I always think about when I think about being in the garden and being here. You may be gone sometimes, but the experiences you get on both really can help mold you into what, a better person. What do you think changed for you while you were gone? Is that what did it? Probably just the, the, le- the leadership I had. Because, you know, when you're in the guard and you haven't deployed yet, all you really know is basic and IIT for continuous army time. So when you deploy, that's your real first taste of active duty. Right. And just uh, the way that operated and then having to step up and be in charge of what some of the responsibilities I had on deployment, that really helped help that. And then it just gave me a lot of confidence in mm-hmm. some of my skills as well. So that transitioned to the fire department, though, for you, right? For sure. Because I felt like when I came back, then I was – I. I felt like I had so much more confidence than when I left mm-hmm. as a firefighter. Yeah. How did you transition that to firefighting, though? You know what I mean? Just taking that confidence with, with some of the skills, I think. that Because you know, I was rusty on my skills when I came back, but I, I felt like I was a bit more of a critical thinker. I went from being just be on my officer's hip, do what he tells me to do, to looking at the bigger picture and actually using a little more common sense in how we operate and being like, well, this works for me, so I'm a – putting a little a little just a little bit of seasoning on how i how i do things not, not change anything too crazy but just that, that confidence i think was the biggest thing well it's good you could make that transition though from the guard side to the fire side mm-hmm. because you know me only knowing you on the fire side you know i saw it when you came back personally i can attest yeah, to that you I did change that. yeah you know you grew you could tell wow that kid grew up a little bit it's crazy because he yeah. was a kid when he got hired. I was yeah. the same way. Mm-hmm. I was a kid when I got hired on the fire department. and then, But to see that switch when you came back, it's just interesting that you were gone and made that switch and you came back and guys were like, who's this guy? Yeah. It's like a different kid that came back. Well, that's good that you could make that transition yeah. and it helped it was, you. And you might, you might say that you were thrown into it, thrust into it a little bit. Some, some of the responsibilities like, for sure. Boom. Hey, here you go. Mm-hmm. Here's this. Run with it. See what happens. Or maybe on the – on the fire side, it would just take a little bit longer. Didn't have the opportunity, yeah. right? Yeah. Which is unfortunate because, like you were talking earlier, that opportunity could come your next tour or next shift. Yeah. Officer goes down, what are you going to do now? Mm-hmm. Right. You know, the guy, you two guys you were with just went down, and you're the least senior guy there. You're going to have to step up. You're going to have to. It's just, it's good that that doesn't happen, obviously, mm-hmm. and that we aren't put into those situations, but – for the younger men and women out there, that could happen next shift. So well, yeah, yeah it, well, and you could be a guy with you know just a few years on the job, and then you got and the people that are on the back, you know, are two you know guys that are just off probation or something, or even a, a, for whatever reason a probie that they might have floated out. So here you are, you know, sitting in a seat, maybe your first time acting with two guys, you know, all together. You have maybe you know ten years experience between the three of you. And you're in that position again. That's why you know. That's why we need to. It is so important that we're, mm-hmm. we're training those replacement stuff so that you at least have some kind of instead of just being like, I don't even. I have no idea what to do. But at least you're like, okay, I haven't been in this position, but I, I'm 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 okay. I can I can do this. I know you know. I've I've I, I paid attention. I've had somebody you know kind of mentoring me, telling me you know I, I think I can. I think I'll be okay. We can we can make this work. You know. And then you know vice versa. Being on the fire department. All the stuff I've learned here makes me a really good at my craft being a medic in the guard. Because now we were on there deployment, I was sometimes I'd be the subject matter expert on certain things medical because we have people that don't do this outside. Right. And so they go, "Well, Morehead, what do you think?" And I'm like, "Well, from so going on all all the calls that we go on and being as busy as we are, that makes me a better medic in the guard as well." Oh, without a it's doubt. Just, awesome. I, I, would, I, I love how they work hand in hand. I would totally agree. The 
I mean, we're doing we're doing stuff all the time and seeing high level calls that challenge us, you know, whether it's medical stuff or trauma. And hey, how last time you went to drill, did you have any did you have any patients? No, we did not. No. Yeah, right. So it's it's probably one of those deals. You may get one on an annual training where mm-hmm. a two week bait two week two week uh, trip, but I mean, think about your last time you ran two weeks worth of calls at the fire department. Like, you do stuff all the time. Yeah. So you can take that big time apply to the the guard side if, if you're a medic, uh, which is which is huge for sure. It's not. It, I said I, I was teaching a combat lifesaver course years ago, and that we had a handful of medics in there. Uh, one of the unique things I did after I left the long range surveillance detachment, I went to medical command in Lincoln. That was right when they were starting to roll out national registry PHTLS to all medics had to be that in the, yeah. in the state or in the guard, uh, I should say army wide. So we travel all over the place and I was encouraging guys like, Hey, if, if you are a computer dude and you're a medic in the army, you have got to get reps doing medical stuff somewhere other than drill. It's just not, you're just, it's just not going to sure. happen. So, yeah. Hey, join your local volunteer fire department. They need dudes and you can get experience there. Plus you're helping your friends, family, neighbors, etc. Mm-hmm. And it, I mean, the, I'm, I'm a volunteer firefighter. Uh, it, any and all things that you can do within the community help. So, hey, get reps doing it that way. So there's your education experience piece on one little thing that you can do locally. Absolutely. Trying to get on a department. You were talking about being a volunteer, just kind of get into what else you do. Um, well, let's back up here. You went to paramedic school in 2008. You yep. want to talk about making that transition? Yeah, yes. that because because that, that was with that because and and get into the, also maybe how Council Bluff kind of operates because you said that you get so you did your academy. And then you went to like an engine and truck for about a year, and then you go to a medic. You're assigned to a medic unit, yep. so kind of, I guess, yeah, and ta- tailor that into the medic school. And well, stuff let's just that. start off with like, how does how is Council Bluff structured? What do you guys look like? Stations, crews, yep, manning, staffing, so, stuff like that. So Council Bluffs, a little bit smaller than Sioux City as far as uh, population wise, sixty ish thousand people. Of course, I twenty nine I eighty run through there, so we get lots of traffic uh, daily. Uh, roughly forty five square miles there. We've got a few, a little over 100 firefighters there. We've been paid since the 1850s, and wow. we run five stations, um, three shifts. We've got five engines, two trucks, three medic units, and then we've got two backup medic units that are, if everybody gets mm-hmm. you know, kicked out and yep. we've still got guys in stations, they can jump on Which those probably happens. Yeah, it happens Quite a bit now. often. I mean, we're yeah. pulling volunteer departments in to help us out on calls we're also pulling omaha in uh, so we we need to uh up staffing but hey you know how it is that's uh, everywhere, yeah, right? that's everywhere that's, yeah we can yep. say the same yeah for budget sure. um yep. we ran a little over eleven thousand calls last year wow. and sixty wow. ish thousand people so we, we stay pretty busy yeah, that's busy um the ever rigs als we got drug boxes all that good stuff in there we, we did our transition so we're fire-based ems uh we do transport um we, for example, if uh, we don't do, we'll do emergency transports, but or emergency transfers. Oh yeah. But we, so we don't necessarily the no nine facility the nine one one stuff. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> and we did our transition from fire only to fire EMS in ninety seven, I believe, Jeez. and that was that was really pushed by the union at that time. Uh, the union made the sales pitch to, or along with administration, worked that out and got that all transferred over. We're still battling it a little bit where uh, I, th- I think guys do a phenomenal job of incorporating both the EMS and fire. But when I first came on, I was like, hey, I, I, you don't want to go to paramedic school. You're just going to be on the ambulance. You're just going to do all that kind of stuff. Um, I, of course, being a medic in the Army, had a huge interest in going to paramedic liked school. It, yeah. yeah, so as soon as I could try to get in there, I, I did that. Sure. Uh, so, But your guys are... So you you staff the ambulance. It's not like the engine company goes on the ambulance. The Correct. ambulance is staffed with no, medics. They're staffed. And yep. you guys yeah. and your firefighters first, but then are also medics. So yep. you're you're cross trained for both. So yeah. So you're, in, so you're it's not like a separate <clears throat> EMS division. It's all right. It's a cross trained. So if you so yeah. everybody, uh, for example, we're doing hiring right now. Anybody and everybody can apply. You get bonus points if you're an EMT. You get additional bonus points if you're a paramedic. We will make a, you will not get offered a job unless you are an EMT. We have an EMT list and we have a paramedic list. We will hire just kind of based on needs, but everybody, regardless if you're a B or a P, you will go through the fire academy. Uh, hey, you're a firefighter first, and then either a B or P mm-hmm. second. You know, For air sure. quotes there. Um, but yeah, you run a you're 
jumping on the squad, you've got, you know, full bunker gear, air packs, all that good stuff. You're trained up just like everybody else. Um, and we've had guys catch fires first on location because, hey, they're driving somewhere, see smoke, all that other stuff. Everybody knows that story. Um, you they, see stuff. They got a can on there or anything? That's okay. Um, I, I, I don't want to say one way or another. I don't believe so, okay. but I, I'm just wondering. I that, I'm just trying to see it in yeah. my head. I'm yeah. a visual guy. <laughs> so we have, we've had guys ask for cans. We've had guys ask for forcible entry sure. tools, all that stuff. Um, but yeah, full bunker gear, air packs, all that cool right there. Yep. And they will attempt to, I mean, I, I, I know we've had a fire in the past couple of years where uh, medic three sees smoke before even being dispatched. They get there, they try to make entry into the second level Man, to try to make that. the grab. Wow. And they don't even have water. And love it's, that. It's because love we're, it. You know, we're trying to push that search culture Aggressive. big time. Yeah. Um, and we did end up uh, having crews pull two kids out of that Sweet. second level, oh, that's awesome. which was awesome. That's crazy. Uh, those crazy. guys went in, and they were not able to make access uh, to the second level. It was, uh, it was a home that had been converted to apartments like so many of them. Like so we had, them, yeah. Yeah, like yeah. all of them. Yeah. Yeah. We, so we had apartment on the first level, apartment on the second level. Uh, lots of learning things came out of that one. Absolutely. Goofy. Uh, car in the driveway, super steep pitched roof to try to get access on the uh, Charlie side. So, an interesting thing came from that. But yeah, everybody's firefighter first, B or a P second. Okay. Okay. So how long then? Once you so you get it on a medic unit, and then how long? Uh, how long are you riding the riding the box then? It's a little it, like when I first got on, you would do nine weeks on, and then roughly nine weeks off. And now it's kind of shift dependent. Um, so you might do a set on and a set off. Uh, you could do a handful of sets on there. Sure. We call them sets. So we do, comes plus schedule, we do, best way to explain it would be we do Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So go in at 7, off at 7, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then you get, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, four days off. And then the next week would be Wednesday, Friday, Sunday, and it just kind of mm -hmm. keeps. Working 12. So you, you, don't do three, oh, okay. oh. Okay. Yep. you don't do a Kelly system, though? Nope. So yours is like the California swing shift, basically, yes. kind of? Yep. A version of that? I worked the same thing in Dodge, that's why I'm. Yeah, I know exactly. What Greatest thing about. ever. Well, actually, I, twenty four on, uh, twenty four on three off would be awesome too. Uh, Forty eight ninety six would be interesting. I'd be interested in trying that. I don't know, man. I said the only if other you got your butt kicked. I like I love the twenty four forty eight. The only other one I saw was better was Indianapolis does twenty four forty eight, and your it was either the fifth or the seventh. Twenty four is your Kelly day, then so then you would have a five day stretch. Yeah, there. that five day so stretch that, that like cool. like you guys Wichita does the same thing. Yeah. That's that's awesome. It'd just be great if they were maybe a little more frequent. I mean, that's one thing nice, you know. Oh, sure. You were, really, we, yeah. we just say, hey, I, I work Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So what, where are you at in the whole shift? Ah, today's my Wednesday. Oh, you know, that's easy. You got today and one more day and you're oh, off. Oh, I'm just yeah. coming on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty slick in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, roughly two months on the squad is what yeah. we used to do. And then you go off for two months unless – somebody's of course is that sick or, is that everybody or is that just younger guys once you get more seniority do you just do just just an engine or truck or do you always kind of rotate to the medic it, it's primarily firefighters but i mean we I, I know captains right now that say hey i need squad time because there you go and yeah. i'm an advocate of it i i think me as a as a captain i'm getting paramedic pay i should be on the squad you know staying sharp on those skills because i got to help guys mm -hmm. and we get called in for overtime, so all those other things you can end up on the squad just as easy. I feel like it takes the burden off of the young guys too, like for burnout and yeah stuff I mean, like cause that. Because those guys, it, it's funny when I got hired on Council Bluffs, we were doing roughly four thousand calls a year, so our call volume is roughly tripled. Uh, I can think of my worst day on the squad; I maybe had thirteen to fifteen, and an average day was five. Well, now. An average day is ten, yeah. and it's not uncommon to get twenty plus. Yeah. So those guys are getting their Rear butts kicked. Yeah. kicked. Oh yeah, we and see the same thing here yeah. with, yeah, with our sure. EMS division people and stuff. And yep. you know, and, and difference being that our EMS division is they are a single role EMT or paramedics. Mm -hmm. So right. that's they're they're assigned to that rig. That's all they do. Yep. You know, is is the EMS stuff. So, um, but yeah, so you came on. So again, um academy on a rig so but you didn't go to actually so you worked on a medic unit as just as an emt not just an emt but as an emt right and then medic in like 2000 what do we got 2008 ish and stuff then went to yeah so, so our medic units run a b driver uh paramedic passenger and every once in a while you know over time or manning or whatever else you'll get two medics on there and if there's two medics um you'll usually rotate calls and actually the guys now 
they do phenomenal. Bees jump on calls all the time. Perfect. So uh, yeah. it, it just shares the workload. Uh, mm -hmm. That's always been a little bit of a concern because going back to some guys pull their weight and some guys don't, there's always the fear <laughs> that the medics can be like, ah, B level call, B level call, mm -hmm. B level call, right. and they're just wearing, the, wearing their driver out, um, which isn't cool. You know, right. those guys make a name for themselves right away. But for the most part, I mean, I, I can think of a whole ton of bees that jump up and take calls, and they'll fight you for it. Like, hey, man, I got this one. Yeah, yeah that's, so, good. that's good. Well, good. And then on the flip side of that and stuff, it's like, oh, we start. it's an ALS, ALS, ALS. You know, yeah, just hammering yeah, totally. ALS. Yes. You know, people, because, right. oh, we put the monitor on, because what's well, an ALS mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, so, so I went to. I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, staffing then on the other rigs real quick. Mm -hmm. if I don't want to brush over it. So you yeah. have the two on the medic units. Is it three man engine companies? Three man engine, man three truck, man truck. Three man truck. Okay. Yep. And then, uh, then we've got w roughly counts plus the battalion size department. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've we've got uh, the five engines, two trucks, three medic units, one fire car, and then we've also got uh, separate. So th that's our suppression division. Mm -hmm. EMS falls under suppression. We've got a training division. In the training division, myself, I run the fire academies. All the uh, upgrade training, anything like that. We're doing regular monthly training. We've got an EMS counterpart, uh, or I have an EMS counterpart that runs all the EMS stuff, which is a new position within the past two years, maybe. Cool. And then we've got a spec ops coordinator, which he handles all rope rescue, confined space, hazmat. Nice. And then our uh, fire marshal's office, mm -hmm. I believe they've got four captains in there. And that's their full-time gig plus a fire marshal. Mm -hmm. So they those guys are super busy yeah. in and out of buildings all the time, yep. just trying to do regular upkeep on that. So with you said battalions, do you guys do you guys run battalions and, and stuff or not? Or is it no, just, because nope. we're just yeah. that's all we got is one. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Which is interesting. You know, I was, I was chatting with I was chatting with some of the guys from Omaha that I know, and we're chatting about comparisons. Hey, Omaha versus CB. I'm like, well, cool. You got seven CBs in Omaha. Cause yeah, I run pretty seven much. Giants. Right. So it changes things like. As soon as we go from a one battalion size department, lo looking at training specifically, yep. um, a few weeks back we did uh, a, a fires in a parking garage. Well, it was easy because I just picked three days, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Yep. I run A shift Monday, B shift Tuesday, C shift Wednesday, knock out all the guys, we're good. Well, as soon as we had a second battalion to that, things started to get a little more creative where, hey, that training just gets yeah. tenfold. So uh, Omaha, you know, hey, they have challenges doing that because yeah. does every battalion have a training officer right you know right. or do you split the city in half yeah. or do yeah. You, yeah yeah so what's nice about sioux city and cb is that we're small we should be pretty agile on that and be able to adjust uh, omaha having there'd be a little bit more of a challenge but of course they have some better resources as well sure mm -hmm. yeah we're running out of medic units hey they've got a whole bunch of them so while it doesn't necessarily happen uh it's i mean it's still a possibility yeah, yeah. How many, how many paramedics you got down in Council Bluffs? I believe we're up over 50% now. Wow. Good for you guys. Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, hey, 80, 84% of our calls are still EMS. Yep, yep. definitely. But, yep. yeah, we're, we're uh, really proactive on hiring medics. Uh, the department, really the whole time I've been there, I would say administration has been pro-paramedic. So, you know, I, I was hired as a B in 2002. I went to OFD's paramedic school, and I think I started in 07, 08. Okay. And um, – it was, it was a pretty cool opportunity. They ran the same paramedic class on Monday, Tuesday, and then they ran the same class on Wednesday, Thursday. So if guys were on shift, oh, cool. you could go. Yeah. If uh, I did everything on my days off, so I'd go do my regular shift work. When I got off, I'd run to class. So I'd catch either a, you know one of, those, one of those two days a week, knock that out, and then because you have to get so much squat time, patient contacts, everything else, I went on the medic unit in – Let's say we started that in August of 08. I stayed on the medic unit for a good year and a half while I was knocking out medic school. Um, so that, that was cool. Do you guys take on, um, like, people in paramedic programs and do yeah, ride-alongs so and student, things like that? Time. And yeah. like, people get their ride times through Council yep. Bluffs? We work a lot with uh, Creighton, Iowa Western. Yep. Uh, they're always doing ride time. Uh, we try to snag those guys up and say, hey, we, we know that you're getting a stack of books this high all about how you're supposed to be, you know, a paramedic. Mm -hmm. When was the last time you looked at one of the departments that you're serving and, and checked out the protocols? Like, ah, I haven't. I'm saying, cool, here, here's, your, uh, 
here's what you can actually do, which that's yes. always a big transition. Yes. Yep. You're going from, it is. I've got all this stuff that I've got to try to figure out. And then no, no dude, here, this is all you can do. Right. So and then you go down the road to council bluffs. It's different than here. Right. Or you go up the road to somewhere else. It's different. So yep. yeah, 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 that's, that's a good, you, you talk about piece of you know, snagging those guys up. What's the recruiting and retention in council bluffs like? <laughs> Better than the police department. Okay. Okay. Uh, Nationally, yeah. Yeah, everywhere, (laughs) right? Um, I believe the, and I'm going to mess the numbers up, I want to say we could take 200 applications this last time, and we took 170 in, and then we had 123 tests, and everybody moved on regardless of their score. So if you scored one on the written, hey, you move on to the next step. And the, and the, the reason that we... We didn't start off that way, but we ended up doing a little tweak mid-testing. And the, and the reason for that is, and we know some of these people, I mean, the guy that scored number one on the test quite possibly doesn't have any certifications. So he yeah. might not have B, he might not have his P. He may fail the CPAT. So hey, why not let everybody go through and then see how it all shakes out at the end. And we're going to end up, everybody that passes CPAT gets an interview, panel interview. Mm-hmm. Um, that's how ours works. Uh, you apply, you do written, you do the CPAT. Then you do a board interview, mm-hmm. and then after that, they start looking at things, and then I believe everybody will interview with the chief. Uh, once they make it to a certain point, like the top 60 will interview with the chief, and then they come up with a list of uh, 40. 40. That list is good for three years. Yeah. And then everyone on the list goes through Academy, you said? Well, or we'll, is it? we'll only hire so many. So I believe, so I've been in the training division since May of 2017, and we had, my first class was five. My second class, I had 12. My third class, okay. I had nine. Okay, it's just nine. whoever gets offered. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So how many academies will you do a year? It just depends. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Sure. From 17 to, I'm going to mess up the years. I believe it was 21. We only did one academy. So oh. we hired five oh, guys from 17 yeah. to 21. Four years. Gotcha. Oh. Yeah. So, and, so all right, that, that makes more sense. It's not, you, because uh, you've also said you run like officer academies and engineer academies. Right. Yeah, so like that. I should I should have backed up when I was given a little history on Council Bluffs Fire Department. We've got so you, everybody's hired as a as a firefighter. Everybody goes to the fire academy. Once you have two years on and have completed the requirements to take the engineer academy, you go through that. So there's uh, study material you have to do on your own with written tests, and then you sit for a five five day ten hour ten hour day uh, engineer academy that certifies you on all the rigs. So. Day one is in the classroom, just kind of take, trying to take this stuff from the book and apply it to the real world. Sure. Then after that, you're out there pumping um, or setting up trucks, whatever the case may be. Once you get done with that, and if, if you pass everything, uh, which they everybody has because, hey, we spend four days pumping, they're good to go. Once you have two years on, have completed the requirements, you can test for engineer, super competitive. Is that um, so? Are, are your engineer? Are they do your drivers are FEOs or engineers? A promo- is, that a, a is that a promoted spot. position yeah, promotable for you spot. guys? Yeah. Okay. So you have to have two years on, completed all that stuff, test. Um, I believe like there were like 27 people that took the test when I got promoted, mm-hmm. and they'll make a list of 10. It's good for oh, three wow. years. So it's super wow, competitive. Wow, that's competitive. Wow. Yeah. You, you cannot move up in the promotion steps unless you're an engineer. So that's so why they're fighting for That was my other question. Yeah. Can you just, after a certain amount of years, can you apply to be a lieutenant, or do you have to be an engineer at some point? No, so we, we just do driver and then captains. We don't run lieutenants. Okay, sorry. Which creates a little sorry. bit of a, which is an interesting discussion to have. But, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, so. I was wondering, when you said you had four captains in the bureau, I was kind of like doing the, trying to do yeah. the math in my head. I'm like, that's a lot of captains. But yeah. if that's the p- next so, position, that makes sense. Yep, mm. so. so you gotta be a driver for two years, and then you can test for captain. So you, oh, have to wow. be a, you have to have two years time in, grade four years time i'm sorry six years time in service before you can test for captain Jeez. and that's super competitive as well mm-hmm. uh, sure. I, d- I don't remember exactly uh, how many people took it the last time but so even so a guy so it, even as a firefighter i get my two years on and go to my engineer go to my driver academy yep and get my certification and then now and you said that list is good for two so two, well uh, once you years. once you apply so if I get my certification, is I so am I on the driver list now, or do I still have to test for the driver position? So you, you can drive, but you cannot. You can you can drive if vacations, everything yep. else. You are on but the you're not driver assigned, list. But you're not an assigned driver. Right, and yet. so you can okay. even get acting pay. Right, but you are active wearing driver pay. Right? But then yeah. so then and then once you're so then once I test, I'm on like the higher the driver list, and the, is that list like the promotional list? That yep. list is good for 
uh, three years. Okay. So then once that three-year list expires, do I have to retest for a driver? Yeah. Position? Okay. So a guy, so I mean, really, I mean, a guy could sit for a long time before, I mean, just in the, even in the promotional process of yeah. just waiting just to get that driver's spot. Cause then, and then you said two years there before you can even attest for the captain's position. Correct. So your guy could yeah. be on the job. for. Yeah, so you will be on before. the job a minimum of six years before you're, you're putting in for a captain's promotion. Yep. Okay. And, and then that, the challenge is you can, I mean, I can think of several guys that have made multiple lists and maybe they take one dude off of a list. Right. Sure. And so yeah, guess what? No big deal. Yeah. Awesome. You get a test again. Yeah. So I was super fortunate. Hey, I, I get on council plus my first time I get promoted on my first engineer's list. I get promoted on my first captain's list. Uh, Away she goes. It's yeah. Sometimes she goes. Yeah. Sometimes so, she doesn't, but she right. went mm-hmm. for you. Huh? Yeah. So it's, it's uh, just one of those things. Yeah. Wow. Um, then you said filling in for those spots. Sorry, I'm totally yep. into this too. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> uh, so all the drivers are gone for that shift or something or whatever. Right. It's guys bump up to mm-hmm. get the acting dri- th- what's but the they has to be the, cert- the but you have to be a that? certified driver. You have right. to have gone through the driver's academy to fill in for Correct. a driver. Yeah. Oh wow. Yep. So, so are you- people getting I hate to drop the M bomb, but mandated into that then? Like if, like if there's no, no ship, like there's no, no guys that have been through the or driver's that academy, or is that just everybody never comes is? Out? Council Bluffs, th- those dudes are. I mean, I would say they're all motivated. Like, I mean, the first time we did, we've ran two driver operator academies in the past three years. I'll say first one we had like thirty dudes go through it. Sure. And then this last one, I think we had maybe fifteen. Well, a driver spot is the best job in the department. I could say that first hand. Right? Is that right, uh, Master Firefighter Baker? Okay. Yeah, that's a confirm. <laughs> so. Yeah. The uh, so yeah, it no one is getting pushed into that. And it's really one of those deals like, hey, if you don't want to drive, like, no big deal. Don't go to the academy. Sure. If you are certified, like, you better have a really good reason on why you don't want to drive. Because is it you're, or you have issues acting? What you need reps acting? You need to go to the sure. tower and pump, set up the rig, whatever else the case may be. Mm-hmm. Um, like every department, hey, there's always people injured, sick, vacations, yeah, all that other stuff. So you, that, you get lots of opportunities to good bump so up to each motivated spot. individuals. So you're yeah. so you're on the so I mean so I mean the scenario then with that you could be you could be on the guy on the back of the rig with twelve years on, you know, and but you haven't been to the driver that you haven't been to the academy with twelve right. years on to get right, or, and then you got a kid the driver's gone. You got a kid with three years on the job because he's been to the academy would be driving that day then. Correct. Ahead of you. Yeah. Yep. That's probably a rarity though from the way you're explaining. It, or yeah, is it? it is. It is a rarity. I know okay. of. I, know, I mean, I know of a couple guys that that's been the case, mm-hmm. but they just didn't sure. want to drive. But most of those guys, I mean, probably more than capable. They just. Oh yeah, totally. I yeah. want to ride the back seat. I want the pipe, or I right. want. Yeah. I and want the, to and do the large dirty work or whatever. I, d- I don't want to say that guys are hungry to promote. Of course, you always have those dudes, but sure. For the most part. Everybody is really motivated as far as if that school comes open. We're huge on pro education down there. So actually, Company Officer Academy, we have next week, we have um, engineers in there. Because sure. to promote to captain, you have to have six years time in service, two years as an, an engineer. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. But we've got guys that are engineers. We've got guys that are on the engineer list. And then we have guys that are firefighters in there so that, I mean. Sure. It goes back to what we said on the Army. Hey, you've been here an hour. Guess what? You're in charge of the guy that's yeah, been here absolutely. 30 minutes. Yep. Yeah. And no harm, no foul. It actually makes my job easier as a captain if, mm-hmm. if my firefighter scored away and I've taught him everything Making he knows. Making you well-rounded, yeah, if like, anything. Hey, bro, go take care of that over there for me while I'm managing this part. Are you guys having a problem? You said your last your last list still had like 170-some or 130-some-odd people take the test? Yeah, so we had good. yeah uh, one, 170 take it. Uh, all of them. I'm sorry. We took 170 applications, yeah. 120. But that's good, though. Ahead. I mean, that's still a lot. I mean, we're you know we're having a hard time with numbers and stuff. What I mean, do you guys do any uh, active recruiting efforts and stuff? Do you guys go and, and do anything? Any advertising? Any you know uh, job fairs? Things so like do, that? do you guys do any active recruiting? Yeah, we try to do some job fairs, and then we'll do uh, our EMS guy super proactive. He uh, started doing some job shadowing stuff, which is a lot. Some of the high schoolers come in and check it out. Um, I think our, I think just our regular culture of yep. trying to recruit guys has been, it's been pretty well received down there. We always had a problem on Omaha where, I'm sorry, on Council Plus where we'd lose guys to Omaha. Right mm-hmm. across the river, Omaha made more money. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you had to live in Iowa. Well, on Council Bluffs, you can live with, we, 
we were part of the uh, we had a handful of guys that went up to the legislature and helped get the uh, code yeah. change to yes. where you could live across state lines if you wanted to. So mm-hmm. on Council Bluffs, you can live 60 miles from headquarters. So yeah. we've got guys Big living circle. in Lincoln. Yeah. yeah, love it. Uh, which of course that opens up. We have a, we have a weird. You're saying that helps. That helps. Yeah. A lot. Okay. Yeah. It helps. I just want to get that recorded. With, with okay. The, well, yeah, awesome. because, well, if you yeah, guys get awesome. hundred with a smaller department in a smaller town, you're getting more applicants. And you don't think that like hurts outside, outside smaller agencies or anything like that? No. No. Okay. It, it's it was always a, a big push, you know, because we're we're we want local guys because I think you absolutely get, you, you get do. something absolutely you do a guy that grew, grew up in Council Bluffs that's been around there forever he knows all kinds of stuff he's probably been in you know whatever building it is it's changed 25 times he's been in there who knows how many times right yeah. so there's a huge benefit that comes with that yet at the same time like ultimately you want the best applicant you don't care where they come from yep. and so you just have to you know maybe shore up uh hey his yeah. familiarity with uh sioux city council bluffs etc well hey guess what if he's working 10 24-hour shifts a month and he's in those buildings hey maybe i'm just going to be a little more progressive and proactive with hey guess what i know you're not from here we're going to go in here we're going to look at this we're going to talk about all the main thoroughfares through town etc 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 which is crazy because even people that grow up in those towns don't have to look at it from that perspective until they're in it so right. you end up teaching people maybe that grew up around the area the same things right yeah yeah yeah. Hmm. Okay. So. All right. Thanks for yeah. answering that. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, I love it. the the big thing on the the promotions. Hey, you get once you're captain for two years and have so many years on that you can test for assistant chief. Um, that's a three year list as well. It just keeps okay. going from there. Yeah. Yeah. What? Um, so you said to you guys. So kind of in your training division or whatever you've got. You know, you got fire training that you're kind of in charge of the right. EMS division. Um, and then uh um. Uh, a tech rescue division of stuff. So do you guys with, with that, with your tech rescue, I guess your guys trainer, how you're doing. So like Sioux city, right? Each station has a specialty that mm-hmm. we're doing. So fours and now, you know, you know, I was at fours for 12 years now, I'm out at eights, but you know, ours is hazmat. The guys down at ones do our tech rescue fives is now tech rescue and extrication stuff. Um, but like not, so I'm not, I can have like aware or ops level for tech right. rescue. I'm not, a, I'm not a rescue tech. Um, our unattached personnel, get you know because we do have floaters so i mean they get they get trained to the tech technician level for stuff so how does that for you know what is what is the picture for you guys for is that kind of specialty I, stuff? I would say it's similar everybody comes out of the academy at the ops level okay and then uh, we just ran international through we brought the international in uh, i can't remember the exact numbers but i would say 50 50 ish percent of the department are techs um hmm. our hazmat tech station we, we run a unmanned rescue 30 hmm. which it's, I should say, cross-staff. So either Engine 31's crew or Truck 32's crew jumps on that rig and mans it. We're going to move that out to Station 4, which is where it was years back. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll have one station kind of manning that. Um, and then uh, we've got uh, Station 2 on the west end runs our, our boat that's down on the river. And then we've got uh, Station 5, which is down on the Lake Manawa south side of town. They've got a hovercraft there and a couple oh. other boats. So... They're kind of the ice rescue station, even though uh, nice. Station Two can do some of that as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Fours is Fours is uh, Hazmat headquarters will be rope rescue confined space, all the all that good stuff's on yeah. Engine Thirty One, uh, Station Five, Engine Fifty One. They're running the hovercraft. Twos, uh, Twos, Twenty Ones, Twenty Twos. They're running the boat. Uh, cool. Twos being the primary on that. Yeah. yeah. So kind of kind of the same kind of yeah, setup similar. Stuff. similar. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's cool. Good deal. I just look. I was looking back at here at the on our outline. Uh, let's go back to just the academy itself. It's eight weeks long. Yep. And you said, I remember, from four to 12 candidates, depending on the hiring. Yep. Uh, the, the, the stat that sticks out to me is you do 50 live burns during the academy. Yeah. Let's talk about that. That's, yeah. that's pretty incredible. Yeah. So we're doing, uh, trying to get everything done so that we can burn our third week of the academy. And then we will burn, like the last two we've burned on, on Thursdays. Mm-hmm. So we go in there, we, we have a burn. Um, kind of start off with intro and then we go to single story and then we'll go to two story uh and then we'll just kind of keep adding to that and we we kind of wrap up with a with a night burn but the we go in burn debrief reset roll it again and so thursdays we'll burn four to six hours mm-hmm. wow. probably and get multiple reps that way yeah. hey same next week we roll out do the same thing now we're getting guys lots of reps um trying to take the big job of hey put the house fire out and break it down into smaller 
smaller groups. So, mm-hmm. hey, fire tech, search, vent, med group, et cetera, roll that out, uh, knock it out, and get guys reps so that as soon as they hit the street, they're like, for the most part, yeah. speaking the same language. Do sure. they, uh, do you, when you do that, is it just you and the, the candidates that are, or do you have other engine companies come and assist with that and stuff? I mean, what's, well, I guess, what's the training day picture look like that way? So what we'll do is we will have, um, there's a, there's a whole crew or whole cadre that'll come in and help with that. So we'll okay. pull guys, you know, whoever it is, I'll have firefighters, engineers, captains come in and run that, cool. but I'll take a firefighter that's one of the full-time cadre that's helping me and say, Hey, uh, Pat, James, Josh, Randy, whoever, Hey, guess what? You're running vent group. And so they will run vent group or they'll, they'll run search. And so they've got two dudes assigned to them. They go in, knock out search, fire attack, whatever else the case may be. They call for resources if they need them. Yeah. Uh, the big thing is it's getting them reps. Yep. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. of course it's, we'll jump somebody up to pump so they can, they can get time pumping. Mm-hmm. That way everybody's getting as many reps right. as they can. But yeah. you, but you have like, so you have a cadre of, of individuals that are kind of like part of your training division then to yeah. kind of come in and help the, out. The, the big thing I try to do on the, on the training division with council bluffs is I, it used to be called the drill master. Mm-hmm. I kind of changed that name to where it's the training coordinator because yeah. I don't want it to be Rob's world. I want it to be, Hey, all of us are having input on that because you have different experiences than you do, than you mm-hmm. do, and all these different things. So if I've got, if it's if it's a big enough group, hey, I'll have two full-time firefighters helping me. And I, I want firefighters so they can build firefighters. Mm-hmm. And these dudes, hey, anybody and everybody can apply. I like to say you are being evaluated constantly, right? So I want the best dudes that are going to represent the department at the highest level mm-hmm. possible. Sure. So you're always being interviewed. And I'll get guys in there that I think are going to represent the fire department, put out high quality product. I will help them to build these guys to be their instructors, or be, to be yeah, help these guys build these these new new guys as uh, firefighters. But I have multiple people from across the department come in. Hey, Phil, teach building construction. Hey, you guys are teaching vent, whatever else the case may be, so that they see it from somebody else. Plus, it's good reps for them to run a crew, run run mm-hmm. the training side, and ultimately. It helps the department to be mm-hmm. better as well. Absolutely. If I say, "Hey Ben, you're teaching vertical ventilation," or do you want to? It allows you to kind of nerd out on that and then share that with the department. Mm. And I don't. I do that not only with the with the academy, but then also, hey, if you want to teach search, what do you got for search? I want to do this, and I want to run it these days. All right, cool. How can I help you do that? And we roll it. Good deal. So, nice. so, so they finish their eight or yeah, they finish their eight weeks and then they hit a station. Yep. And how long until they get the blessing and they are, they are badged and. So we give them when you graduate the academy, you get a badge. Okay. And then you're on probation for a year. You roll out to whatever rig it is. For the most part, we'll try to do uh, the academy's two months long. You'll do two months on an engine, two months on a truck, and then your last six months, usually you're rotating on and off of the medic unit. Perfect. So is there, will they rotate stations or they'll just find? They can. Of course, that's a, always a little bit of a challenge. Yeah. Uh, it can be good and bad. Of course, being able to have Captain X as an awesome mentor, the whole your whole academy is great, but it doesn't always happen for whatever reason. True. I could see that. I could see the value in one staying with one crew and yeah. having the same group of mentors. Yeah, it, 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 it totally goes both ways. You can can be a blessing and a curse for sure. So then once they're done, then do they do any sort of floating? Um, yeah. I mean, once they, after that, they, I hate to say it, it's to the wind. Okay. Yep. You could be, uh, I mean, I think, I think the most I've ever floated in one day was four different stations in a day. Yep. Okay. So almost yeah. hit all of them. I think a yeah. lot of us have been you know, there. Yeah. Everybody. Yep. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's one of those deals. Yep. So-and-so called in sick. Oh, Hey, guess what? You're going back there because this guy called in sick. Yep. How, how long do you guys usually float for? Ever. Full, they float forever so oh, it's wow. really one of those deals you are floating until you get promoted to engineer gotcha oh, I wow. mean, you, you can okay. bid rigs but again it's management needs yeah. right so yeah. sure. if they need a paramedic hazmat tech on engine 31 guess what you're moving or hovercraft pilot at station five and somebody's gone you're moving from headquarters to station five to fill in uh, they, of course the ACs do an awesome job trying to manage that and keep mo- moves to a minimum but, but still, it, yeah, still I mean, moving. We got, Probably in we got a fire department to run. That's mm-hmm. right. right? Yeah. So, Good deal. Well, Rob, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, then we'll come back. We'll finish everything up. We'll talk about a couple calls in your career. We'll talk about your family a bit and 
anything else that comes up. So Sounds good. We'll take five. All right, Rob. Uh, can we go back? Can we talk about the tactical medic stuff you do in Council Bluffs? We kind of blew over that. Uh, how long have you been doing that? And kind of describe describe that position a little bit. Yeah, the, the, the department runs the tactical medic program. We've been doing that since, I believe, 07. We've got uh, – currently have five tactical medics. Uh, the tactical medics are, they're all, all paramedics. Um, they have to interview tryout for that mm-hmm. position. And then really we support three of the local tactical teams. So Council Plus uh, Police Department SWAT team or uh, emergency services team, uh, Pottawamie County's emergency response team, which is their SWAT team. And then the uh, swine task force, which is uh, narcotics enforcement, but they also do prostitution stings and gun stuff, all that. So when those guys get activated for a warrant or barricaded subject, whatever else the case may be, we send, we try to send at least two paramedics from the, from the tactical medic side out with them to provide on-site medical coverage. Mm-hmm. Uh, all of us have gone through basic firearms stuff. Uh, we train with those guys monthly. We wear similar or the same uniforms that they do, so body armor helmets, uh, all that all that same stuff. Uh, we've all been to basic SWAT, uh, in, and then from there we've been to a handful of other schools, uh, attack medic instructor schools, shooting schools, all those, those different things. And you guys ever go to Camp Dodge and do the mystic so down there? They do the uh, the advanced SWAT down there, so they're doing that in September, and I, I okay. believe two of us are going. Cool. Um, the, the, the big thing is always, ah, you know, we, hey, we can't put firefighters close to where this is going on because the scene is unsecured. Well, if, if you study any of the rescue task force stuff, the, the big thing is to get guys in there as fast as possible. The, the police department's goal in an active shooter or mm-hmm. active killer situation, they're using vehicles, bombs, whatever else the case may be, is to stop the killing. The fire department or rescue task force goal is to stop the dying. So we need to get people in there ASAP. And uh, the tactical medic is kind of, I hate to say that they're, they're the spearhead of that, but we work the police department all the time. So over the next three months, for example, we're rolling out rescue task force training to the police department with them uh, just to kind of make sure that we're all speaking the same language because we're going to be working with them, mm-hmm. God forbid, one of those incidents. So now, because you guys are SWAT trained and firearms trained and stuff like that, do you guys are you guys with that entry? Like, are you the last person in the door kind of thing, like going in right away? Or are you guys more staged until things are kind of a, a more of a warm zone and then making entry? A little bit of both. So f- we are there to be tactical medics, not necessarily operators. And that line is always <laughs> blurred a little bit. Mm-hmm. So we, we will ride up with the vehicle that those guys are in. Uh, usually, hey, I'm, I'm in the passenger seat in the front of the van. And we step out, I, I hit the door, I open their door so they can get out, go up, do their thing. I'm close enough that uh, I can help if I need to. There have been times where we have been in the rear of the stack, barricaded subject, for example. Um, but we don't have, we are currently in the process of writing, well, writing an SOP that allows us to carry firearms at work. In the past, it's always been absolutely not, no firearms for the uh, firefighters, because again, that line gets blurred. A few years back, I wrote legislation with one of the uh, senators that allows tactical medics that are assigned to a team and signed off on can be issued a professional permit to carry and carry firearms. Because ultimately, we are there as our own protection. Mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Uh, More guns and we, more good guys' hands. Yeah, and, and the thing is, no one is going to differentiate me from no. the police officer. No. Things no, go real not, bad. Right. We've had multiple situations where, for example, we're hitting um, this house and a house – three doors down we know that they have same or similar criminal activity and are connected but we haven't checked all the boxes allow us to execute a search Mm -hmm. warrant on that place Um, so you're kind of caught in the middle and and we've transported patients and now i'm i'm jumping in the back of the squad as a tactical medic because they don't need me on scene anymore going to the hospital and i look like a police officer yeah so again it'd be nice to be able to have protection and and everybody's that's it's still kind of new ground for here mm-hmm. um, it's not new ground if you look across the country uh, I'm in a unique situation I'm, I am a reserve deputy for uh, Fremont County Sheriff's Department and so I've gone through Reserve Law Enforcement Academy uh, doing ride time with them in the FTO program so I'm familiar with all that stuff but it's still new ground on, on the police department side it's still right. new ground in the fire service even though they've been running tactical medics 
I think since the '60s, if you look at yeah, uh, I know like LAPD, my, for my home t- my hometown does you know, and that's a, a town of 8,500 people. A, at one time, they were the eighth busiest department in the state of Minnesota, but they um, but they they have tactical medics and they're the and they train directly with the St. Louis County Sheriff's Department yeah. and stuff, and they're they're tac medics for. Uh, for their teams and stuff. So you guys, so again, so stacked up, but you're not, you're not clearing, you're not Correct. clearing rooms or anything like nope. that. You're still just there for just. Yeah, we're support. just in the back, and, and and the big, the the one that I can specifically think of where I was in the in the rear of the stack was uh, a, a a guy that shot his wife and then ended up shooting himself. They think that's the only guy, so we go in as they go into uh, throw a, a throw phone through the window. They see him laying there. They go ahead and make entry, go on in. I immediately follow them and start uh, doing patient assessment on this guy and get mm-hmm. him out of there rapidly. They still have to clear that structure because absolutely right. It's um, if you look at TECC, civilian version of T Triple C, there's you know different stages on that. So technically, yep. that was the warm zone. Yeah. Um, no one is actively shooting at us right now, so it's not hot, yep. but it hasn't been cleared, so we have to make sure that it's it's yep. good to go. Yep. Um, so it's it's met with a little bit of so maybe resistance. a little bit more and a, a little bit more training than a tr- like a rescue tech. We're starting to do tr- re get back into training with the rescue task force. Yep. But I mean it's it's having uh, operators on the police side uh, escorting us as just firefighters with body armor, helmet, and stuff. Right. But but way way almost I mean really really like lukewarm kind of warm zone that we're going into Correct. and start yeah. kind of doing stuff I think versus the, getting a little I, bit your your warm zone I think is a little bit hotter than, than yeah. ours would be what, what's interesting if you look at the rescue task force model I've, I've got ideal is just let's just say I've got two law enforcement officers that are operating a security piece of that rescue task force mm-hmm. and then I've got two to three firefighters that are going in there yeah. they are a rolling warm zone yeah so they're able to move through that on the fire or on the attack medic side uh, we are technically in the hot zone mm-hmm. I mean Really, okay. If bullets aren't coming our way or going out, it's it's a warm zone. Um, but you know, those guys all have their either rifles out or pistols out, mm-hmm. shield up, all that mm-hmm. other good stuff. They're working for it. We're just close enough that we can grab them. Uh, the nice thing is, when we go on location, hey, we we establish command. Um, if need be, we can grab a ground channel, start allocating resources in there, uh, request different units and such. Uh, we've also had calls where barricaded subject traditionally they'll send. The fire department there to stand by a block or two off scene mm-hmm. in a safe spot well mm-hmm. then you've got an engine company and a medic unit out of service while they're standing by waiting for something to happen the tac medics get there do a quick size up talk to uh on-scene commander figure out what's going on we can kick those guys loose so we have additional resources back in service yeah. and then we're there if they need us and then hey all i have to do is get on the horn if everything goes correctly so, yeah. and just say hey dispatch Tac Medic Nine, send me X, Y, and Z. So this should be able to roll that uh, out. Nice. This RTF, they they pull from guys on shift. If you're on your day off, you shouldn't get called in to to deal with the SWAT team. No. Uh, so what we do for the tactical medics, ideally, it is done all off duty, so that we're not disrupting daily operations. That, makes, sense. that makes more sense. Though. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So it works out really, really well. The the big thing is, and I'm sure you guys agree. Hey, police and fire are working together all the time. Mm-hmm. Okay. So. We'll, for whatever the case may be, I, you know, I know, hey, CB's dispatched, they go they go on the radio and let PD know that we're going to be going code three or we're getting dispatched to X, Y, and Z. Uh, they've got to get guys there because the scene's unsecured. The better relationship we have with them, the better it is. Plus, I want those guys coming to us saying, hey, man, I've been feeling goofy. Can you check me out real quick? I'd rather have them do that at the station than go home and we find them the next day dead of a heart attack. So, mm, yeah. Uh, I say the highest level customer service comes from that relationship right there. The tighter we are with them, the the, the better things get. Yeah. So yeah. How, how often do your RTS get spun up? So the 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 TAC medics, I'll say twelve activations a year. I, okay. It's probably less than that. In some years, it's more. But and that's mainly because we're supporting those three different teams. It's been slow the last couple of years, and talking to. Even o, uh, OPD SWAT team, they're traditionally super active. I think they've been a little bit slower as well. And mm. you could say, hey, maybe that's some of the culture that's going on uh, nationwide. Mm-hmm. You know, people are a little resistant to a little more red tape to activate the SWAT e- team. Yeah, yeah, just more cautious. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's uh, a, the the tactical medic program is my baby. I love it. Uh, to me, it was the 
the closest thing I could get to being a medic in the Army. Just I love that relationship that the medics have with the infantry guys. And really, mm-hmm. that's what kind of sucked me into the uh, fire services. Mm-hmm. I love that we can go out and help people on their worst day. It's mm-hmm. To me, I say it's the closest thing you can be in to, to being a medic on in the Army yeah. is the yeah. fire department. These guys call you. They need help. Hey, you're going to get there. You might not always do what you thought you were going to do. Yep. Maybe it's just a water heater that's uh, spewing water all over the place. But, uh, hey, the nature of the beast. Yep. That's right. So, you're there to help. Uh, so, yeah, that's obviously one of your passions Yep, is doing that. And you've also had a long career in uh, sports shooting and yep. things like that you want to talk about. Yeah, so it's kind of funny. The uh, I've always had an interest in firearms. Went to my first firearms class. And when I got there, I realized, oh, I'm not as good as I thought I was. <laughs> and, uh, you know, growing up in the Midwest, I think most people have firearms. I went to the first class. I shoot. I'm like, ooh, I'm not shooting as good as these guys. Instructor has lots of uh, tips and tricks and everything else to get better. That's why we're here. That kind of really was jet fuel and getting me going down the path of instruction stuff. Uh, one thing led to another. Went to one class, went to a whole bunch of classes. I started uh, having people hit me up to teach. And so I, I do have my own firearms training business where I do pistol carbine and uh, tactical medic training. And what's interesting is while that's that's not really related to the fire service, I've tried to take a bunch of things from that and from sports shooting. So USPSA, I'm a, I'm a B-class guy. Um, there's Grandmaster, Master, A, B, C, D. And you when you do the competition stuff, you go out and you've got a set stage. You know where all the targets are. You've got all the time in the world, but you're competing against everybody else that's there or your peers as far as accuracy and time. So how long does it take you to work through this course of fire? How well did you do? Um, I took the firearms training stuff that I did and then the USPSA stuff that I did and tried to apply it to the fire service because I, I love that. And what I've, what I've tried to do is take some of the, hey, how long does it take to charge a hydrant? Like we should know that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I should know how long it takes to flush it because we don't have time to flush it. How long does it take you to flush it? Well, I don't know. Well, why don't you know? Uh, we've never put it on a stopwatch. Well, maybe we should. How long does it take me to deploy a line? Uh, how long does it take to charge the line once you get it all off? How, you know, all those things. So having those time standards or that foundation for time standards that I pulled from the USPSA stuff and then applying to the fire service has helped me grow, and I try to share that with the other guys so that they have at least something to compare it to. If you're not measuring, how do you know if you're getting better or worse? Sure, right. That's yeah. a good point. So that's, uh, I, I love that part of the firearms training side and the competition. And then I, I think it directly relates to anything that we do on the fire service. Sure. I mean, you kind of know, man, that guy's bobbling. Okay, well, how bad is he bobbling deployment of the cross lay? Well, I don't know. Well, let's put him on a stopwatch and see. Yeah. Like, did you realize that you handled that thing for 20 seconds before you even got it out of the hose bed? No, I didn't. You know? So, uh, like on the competition side, I film every, every every run that I do, do the same thing with my boys. We go back, review it. Uh, you know, I can tell, hey, I was fishing for the optic on this one. Well, it's, I can do the exact same thing on uh, cross lay deployment or whatever else the case may be. Yeah, Did definitely. you realize that you pulled on that saw 10 times and then you flooded it and you don't know how to fix it after you flooded it? Uh, Etc. So well, and it goes back to just the reps, you know, and doing the reps and doing Huge. the reps, right? Because you look at you know professional sports teams, professional shooters like that, you know, they they're they're as good as they are because you know they practice, they w- look at film, they critique themselves, they go back and they do it again. You know, we're we're as professional firefighters, why why aren't we doing the same? Right. Thing? Why can't we do the same thing? You know, and yeah. it's why are, even you know when you're working with firearms, it's not always going to the range and shoot you know shooting live rounds and stuff it's you know being at home and just dry firing and just right. just doing your just that repetition of just pulling from your holster and just you know and pressing and then putting back and, and just yeah. until it's automatic why same thing like you said right. pulling a pre-connect or you know uh, uh deploying you know whether or even crawling with a hose or doing it it's just those simple yeah. reps of that stuff so it becomes ingrained in your head so you're just like ripping through yeah. it yeah i can i can I, i'm a huge advocate of dry fire dry fire like crazy i can get dry fire reps deploying a cross leg I can get dry fire reps pushing the cross light down a hallway. I can get mm-hmm. dry fire okay. reps making a hydrant. I don't have to get any equipment out. All I'm doing is standing in front of it, going through my head what I'm going to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing when I'm driving. Hey, pull up, set my parking brake, throw it neutral, flip on my levers, jump out, throw my wheel chalk down, uh, start pulling levers, waiting for my captain call for water, and then I'm starting to analyze what it is doing. If I run through all those things in my head at 2 in the morning, it's autopilot. The, the big thing on mm-hmm. shooting is I want to have shooting – run in the background so that I can process things at a high level. Well, 
I would I think everybody would agree, hey, I want to be able to process the fire scene or the conditions in that room, hallway, et cetera. Yeah. And then, you know what's running in the background? Hey, I've already set up my nozzle that I want if I'm running Absolutely. fog. I already know how to move my hose line through. I'm already calling for guys. All these things are happening, and all, I've, all I'm doing I now is I shouldn't have to worry about kinks. Conditions. I shouldn't have to worry totally. about mm-hmm. what my nozzle's set at, like mm-hmm. you said, yeah. while I'm trying to take in all the environment yeah, around me. That should all just be – yeah, I that should just that. be muscle memory, right? So, yeah, uh-huh. Big, big similarities between shooting and fire. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. The 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 funny. I was I was working uh, in Hawaii with a couple of guys that had played. Um, one played for Oregon, and one played for University of Arizona. They were both centers. Then they went on to the pros, and I'm like, and they're both cops in Hawaii. And I said, hey, you guys used to watch film, right? Oh yeah, yeah. And we practice snaps, all those things, over and over again, just beat it into your skull. Yeah, I said. Are we doing the same thing in our other professions? Are we taking the same level of dedication and putting that towards yeah, presentation from the whole store, force and doors, yeah, mm-hmm. all that stuff? And I think uh, most people would probably say, eh, probably not. Now, if I said, if you would have asked me years ago, hey, I'll give you uh, 60, 70, 80, 100,000 dollars a year to be a professional skateboarder, which do I'd be like, heck yeah. Like if somebody offered me that much to be a professional shooter, I'd do it. Well, are we doing the same thing with, Right. are we nerding out on be. the fire service like, like we would like be we on those would other on things. Else. Right. Yeah. It should be. Sure. So you guys why can't you? do any filming training right now? Yeah. So I will. It's not department mandated. And some. this is, of course, met with some resistance. But, sure. Devin, you're like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do X. I'm like, hey, dude, I'm going to film you. And then we'll watch it after the fact so you can take a look at it. And you're like, I didn't realize that I, like, ran into that wall six times before I was able to throw that ladder. Mm-hmm. So I, I love pushing it. I will film guys and share it. Uh, y'all grab, and that, that's something we could do is, as a, the senior firefighter on the rig or the driver or whatever, you know, lieutenant captain, hey, give me your phone real quick. I'm going to watch you make this hydrant. Mm-hmm. And then, pff, hey, go home and watch that. Tell me what you did well, what needs a little bit of work. So that's, again, that tiny little sharpening with uh, 3,000 3, grit sandpaper to get that thing razor sharp. Yes. Mm-hmm. You don't know unless you see it. And uh, so it's huge. Yeah. Film don't lie, right? Film doesn't lie, yeah. Now, what, one, one unique thing. I've, I've had some pushback with that, of course. You know, uh, I, I don't like it that you're filming me or you're, you're comparing me as an old guy that's, you know, been on the department for 20 years and all beat up against somebody who's 19. I'm like, yeah, like, are those variables in how you are going to be able to perform? Yeah, cool. Mm-hmm. So get, take stock of it, analyze it, figure out where you need to modify what it is that you're doing and then right. grow from it. Skill-wise, I should be able to run laps around a new dude because I've got 20 years of doing it. But... Just because you have 20 years on the job doesn't necessarily mean that you have 20 years of experience, 20 years of education. All it means is that you went to the fire academy 20 years ago and you've been riding a rig for yeah. 20 years. What have so, you been doing with that 20 yeah. years? Yeah. And, the, and yeah. the, I'm not dogging on senior guys because no, I'm no, a senior guy. But the fact of the matter is it goes back to how do, guy, how do young guys get on the fire department? Education experience. How do old guys stay relevant? Seeking out education experience. Like – Nothing makes me more stoked when I hear old dudes saying, hey, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, hey, can I go to uh, FDIC? Can I go to FDTN? Hey, they got a fool's class coming up. Can I, can I jump in sure. that class? So, like, you got to earn your spot every day, too. Yeah. Some guys do a phenomenal job of that. Other guys could use a little work. I remember hearing from old instructors, you know, the day you think you know everything's the time is the day you need to leave or hang it up. Yeah. We should probably yeah. practice that a little more than we preach it, you know. Oh, yeah, I mean? totally. Yeah. I think everyone starts out saying that, but then something happens along the way where all of a sudden I get a little comfortable or whatever. Right. I think I think I've been there and done that. Yeah. Until something happens and then yeah, it's back to square one kind of almost. So just don't want to put yourself in that position if you can help avoid that. I've all. I've heard some departments, you know, and I don't I don't know what you guys are doing, but for example, uh, battalion chief rolls up. He's got an iPad that he flips and he can record the, record the entire fire scene mm-hmm. and then go back and review it because we just forget things yes. so hey did you realize you did x well, i didn't do that uh, let's look real quick i think we're yeah, slowly did. transitioning into mm-hmm. maybe getting to a point where we can maybe do that we just got helmet cams cool a everybody's got them. a helmet cam no we okay. just have a couple department yeah. wide right now for training only mm-hmm. okay whether that progresses and we start putting them on rigs or not we'll see how it goes but yeah, yeah i mean like you said why aren't we watching film on mm-hmm. games yeah. that we go to right yeah. i mean it's not a game. It's life and death. Why aren't really? Why aren't we watching yeah. film on fires that we're going to and things like that? You know, critiquing right. ourselves, 
Because you're not going to get better if you don't do the critiquing. No. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get better if you don't recognize the failures or the little things. So. And it, it's a fine line. I know, I know I've, I've screwed this up personally probably, probably more times than I've got it right. But, you know, if I'm, if I'm grabbing you and say, hey, Devin, let's, let's take a look at this mm -hmm. um, to see what we can learn from it is different than, hey, man, you messed up X, Y, and Z. Now, there is a time to say, hey, you messed up X, Y, and Z, but this is a way broader topic we get into, but mm -hmm. me as a friend, coach, mentor that truly wants you to be the absolute best, like I need to make sure that you're comfortable with that, and then I need to be able to, I need to know that you know that deep down in your heart, and so when I say, hey, dude, you, you kind of messed this up, let's let's take a look at it real quick, you're like, yes, yeah. And I, but I want you to be able to give that back to me too, mm -hmm. like, yo, Cap, uh, what were you saying on the radio? That was some gibberish. I'm like, oh, I don't know. Let me go pull the tapes, and hopefully I didn't sound as bad as I think that I'm going to sound, you know? Yeah, we're always, you know, communication. That's one of the biggest breakdowns in operating, in yeah. the fire service, police, whatever. Why aren't we recording and listening totally. to ourselves on the radios? It's, did I really need to say all that right. stuff on the radio? Or yeah. did, I, did I say the right things? Did I think before I, you know? Yeah. Did I think before I speak? Did I not? You know, just... Why aren't we doing more of that? The communication, Maybe we will get to that. The communication but. thing's huge. So we, we ran a rescue task force class uh, two weeks ago with some folks from LSU. So we're doing lots and lots of scenarios. I'm assigned to one rescue task force. There's already another rescue task force in there working on simulated patients. Mm -hmm. I go in and I, I ask the dude, I'm like, hey, what do you got? And he starts telling me everything that he's got. And I'm like, what do I really want to ask him? I'm like, no. I said, I'm going to stop you. He's like, oh. I said, where do you need me? And he says, I need you triage these other three people. I'm like, oh, cool. Perfect. So I, it didn't it didn't really click right at that moment. But then after the fact, I pull him off the side. I'm like, hey, dude, hopefully that wasn't like rude of me. He's like, no, no, it's all good. I said, the reason I did it was for X. And I think that really, if we, if we take that idea and, and apply it to the fire scene, no matter what it is that we're doing, like there is a big difference between what do you got and what do you need? Mm -hmm. So I show up Absolutely. on location on someone that's running something Hey, Cap, I, what do you need? Mm -hmm. I need HydraMade. I need yeah. ladders on all four sides. I need ladders on all the second floor windows, whatever the case may be. It just makes it that much quicker. And if they say, hey, I'm not sure, okay, what do you got? Let me walk you through that process. I think we're trying to work towards that more with, like, we do can reports way more now than even when I started, you know? Mm -hmm. That yeah. wasn't a thing. It was always, what do you have? Yeah, totally. Okay, I'm going to tell you a two-minute story on the radio right now, this bread yes. and butter fire that we've been on 100 times before. Right but yeah. I'm going to paint you a, a picture over the radio. Well, now with the can reports, what are your conditions in there? Yep. Fire's getting knocked. Perfect. Yep. You summed it up for me. I can yep. see that. Or I need another company in here. I need another hand line in here. Yeah. Perfect. I kind of have a picture of what's going on in there. You're yep. not making headway. Need another line. Got it. I think we're working better towards that here. And um, just back to the communication thing, man. That's Yeah, those can should, reports are huge. And I was – chatting with a buddy on CBPD, we were chatting about this exact same thing. And and they push a, a, a similar concept of can reports out all the time. So get there, one guy's wrestling with somebody, hey, what do you need? And they roll right into it, hey, you grab his legs, whatever yeah. the case may be. It just, that what do you need thing is, I think, uh, really kind of well, I need well, uh, gets it going. Right now I need a cigarette, I need uh, water. Uh, right. Well, or it's, I find, and I like, I really like that, that, to, you know, what do you need instead of what do you got or whatever. That To me, that makes more sense because you're just yeah. you're getting to the information. I use, it was a, a teacher one time doing pub ed school visits and stuff, and all of a sudden it clicked. It was, you know, when you when you do, especially the younger kids, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. My grandma's, um, she's old. And like, or you get like, you know, our one time cat, my cat dog, the other day. Yeah. Or my brother. So you get that, you get stories and you can't explain to, you know, kids at a certain age, they don't understand. Don't do this or don't do that. Right. They only hear yeah. do this or do that. Um, or, you know, that, or no stories. They don't understand what no stories are. Yeah. But instead, instead of saying, is there any questions you ask them now, all of a sudden you say, what do you want to know? What's yeah. something you want to know? So then it forces them to like, and they start off, well, this one time, no. I said, what do you want to know? Like, what is this? What is that? You know, what is, you know, so it, it forces them to think different, but it'd be the same thing if you say, hey, what do you what do you need? Instead of like, what do you got? It forces the person giving the statement back to you. Like it forces them to phrase it in a way that all of a sudden they, you know, you get the information that you need. Yes. Right. right. Being you know? more directive with your yeah. 
talking and what what do you need yeah yeah, yeah. Do, yeah. Do what, you do you have a, what do you want to know do you have right. a philosophy on on how to approach corrective action then when it comes to training I should be able to roll off my tongue with that, you know, pretty easily. <laughs> it's um, pretty dynamic. Question. It is, That's yeah. A good it, question, but, it's yeah. ultimately in the end, I, I, the way I approach it is, it's like if whatever class it is that we're teaching, like mm -hmm. I'm there to help you get better, right? Yes. So, as a company officer, senior firefighter, engineer, whatever the case may be, ultimately my goal is to help you manage this scene, this incident, whatever else, as best I can. Now, I think if I can lead with that or get that across, you can almost. I don't want to say you can say anything, but you can provide much more constructive feedback than just rattling off, hey, man, you suck at your job, mm -hmm. even if that's the case. like, um, And that, that is challenging. Again, being direct, it's like, hey, I noticed this. Do you want to get better? No, I'm comfortable with where I am. Okay, cool. Then I'm not going to waste my time yeah. unless I need to do corrective action on it. Sweet. And corrective action being, hey, we have talked about this multiple times and you are not meeting the standard. So unfortunately we're going to take it to the next step, whatever that may be department policy wise. Sure. Um, that's hard. I, I want to give as much feedback as people want. Sometimes you have to limit it down to, okay, all I need this guy to do is step off the rig with his equipment on. That'd be step number one. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, um, yeah. So I don't, I don't know if that so kind of helps yeah. you with that, or yeah, if yeah, I answer I that. I think of like bit. some of the personalities. We have a lot. I feel like a lot of Type A personalities in the military and the fire yeah. service, where they, guys can get easily ruffled. You're, hey, I feel like this needs improvement. You're like, well, you, you mean I, I know what I'm doing? Right. I've been around here for this this long. It's yeah. Like, well, sometimes need to read we need to some humble more ourselves Jocko. a little bit, right? And, yeah. Uh, I I didn't know if with specifically in the fire service dealing with all those personalities as a training officer, if you have developed some sort of good strategy to taking someone that knows what they're doing and telling them how to get better without really insulting them or, or hurting their their fragile ego. Yeah, so much. awesome question and super challenging one to answer. What's what's interesting is I had, I had 15 years in suppression division before I went into the training division. I had been running my own training company for four or six years. One thing that's interesting, private training company, for the most part, people are taking money out of their own pocket, investing their own time. They are there to get better. They want to get better on their own. Fire service or IBM, whoever it is that you're working for, hey, we have a business mandated training day. Well, this is gonna be awesome. So there is a little yeah. bit of a difference yes. there in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, I've had some incredible conversations with people that were extremely comfortable. Hey, me as an engineer in a captain's position trying to tell captains how we could, you know, some things to consider as far as polishing up takes a certain level of tact. I've failed at that more times than I've done it well. Um, Again, I think it goes back to ultimately, hey, I, w I want you to get better, and I'm going to give you some things that might be a little uncomfortable. Talk about this is just my observation. Can you expand on what you're doing, why you did it? And again, is there anything that I can give you to, to grow on that? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, fire service, hey, fire service, firearms, fighting, driving fast, all those things. Uh, there's there's four. Have you guys ever heard of the 4F rule? Let's hear it. Drive fast. Uh, guys are born thinking they could do four things from birth better than anybody else, okay? Drive fast, run firearms, fight. Uh, we could add firefighting to that. There's another <laughs> F that I won't get into, but yep. in actuality, we suck at all of them, yep. right? Yeah. So we need a little bit of coaching to to make sure that we're doing the right thing. That's why I love the firearms thing so much. It is a skills audit right now. Mm -hmm. So training can be a skills audit as well. Like, hey, guys, we're going to come down. I'm gonna tell you everything I can about the drill. I'm not here to make you fail. There's no goofy things, nothing else. All we're gonna do is run you through this. I'm gonna time you, keep track of some notes. I'll give you some feedback. I would like you to tell me what your plan was, uh, how that went, and if you do anything different next time. And then if I approach it without uh, a whole lot of attitude and ego myself, hopefully that gets sure. transferred to the guys. But yeah, it's uh, it can be definitely, it can suck. No. So after the after the fact, hey, I've gone up to guys and be like, "Hey, man, I want to talk to you a little bit about the other day. You, you, it appeared that you were very upset." And I've had it. I've had them come and say, "You know what? I was out of line the other day. I shouldn't have responded the way that I did to you." I'm like, "Oh, was not expecting yeah, that." Or you just stole my thunder. Yeah. You know. But again, I have to. Res I do respect those guys, their position, how long they've been here, and everything else. I just need to make sure that we're they're doing the right thing, and I'm doing the right thing, and we're all grown from it. We're all 
kicking ass and taking care of grandma down the street at the yeah. highest level imaginable. Yeah. Absolutely. If that, hopefully that answers. No, I, I really think that does. I, I appreciate you touching on that. Uh, I want to talk about some calls in your career that stick out. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So it's just over 20 years, got to be a couple things that come to mind. Yep. Um, I'll let, I'll let you start with where you want to start. Yeah. Um, so like, like everybody, Hey, there's those calls that stand out. Like I said, Hey, first day on the job, get a fire that night. I can remember, you know, all, all sorts of little, little things that we did. Um, one of the big ones that stands out, two th- it was l- late summer 2012. Uh, we had a uh, house fire <clears throat> fairly close to the station. It was five-ish in the morning. And at that time, so on, on the west end of Council Bluffs, run a three, uh, two-company house plus a medic unit, so truck 22, engine 21, medic two. And that summer, like every summer, hey, staffing is brutal. Um, we were low. We're always over on overtime budget. And so we had a rig out of service. It was pretty much out of service most of the summer. We get dispatch to house fire. And you know, you can kind of tell when dispatch, I don't know, you guys have automated dispatch now as far as uh, voices coming across? For about the first we, minute. We get okay. that, but yeah. then they follow up with information. Still. Okay, so yeah. at one time you had, oh, it was yeah. all voice. Oh, yeah. So you can tell, even the, even the dispatchers that are, and dispatchers do a phenomenal job. Sometimes you can tell they're a little more spun up, like, oh, hey, mm-hmm. we got the real deal here. Um, and you could tell once, once the uh, dispatch information, the initial tones came out, that it was a, a, a real working house fire. So we get there. We've got uh, medic unit with two. And because we had a rig out of service, we had the engineer, which was a classmate of mine. We had captain that had been there a long time. We had the captain off of truck 22 as the senior firefighter, then me as the fourth firefighter. And we round the corner, and it's uh, roughly four blocks up, and you can see that it's a wall of fire on, on this house. So... It was a story and a half, uh, fire, entire A-side, step off. Mom says, hey, my kid's upstairs in that bedroom. Uh, captain says, hey, let's get a hand line to the Charlie side, and we'll go in from there. So we took a uh, hand line to the Charlie side. We took it down the Delta side, came in the back door, uh, immediately did a 180 there, so we got a little bit of a pinch point, work our way in, and you can't see anything. I remember I'm trying to figure out what this is. I'm wiping my mask off black as black can be trying to figure out I'm like oh that's an oven so I'm just trying to slowly navigate my way I know the stairs in the middle of the house make our way to the stairs hey they do another 180 so I've got two pretty significant pinch points and we've only got three dudes on a on a line Um, and you can't really spread out you can't communicate real well end up going to the top of the stairs it does another 180 so now I've got three pretty significant pinch points Um, this was fire start on the first level worked its way to the second entire alpha sides uh, on fire. We make it maybe, I'll say, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 feet down the hallway and fire alerts start going off. So we'd been in there for a little while trying to just get to this point. Yeah. Super hot upstairs. I remember as I'm, I'm, you know, I've got gloves on and I grab a hold of the hand railing to pull myself up as I'm trying to wrench hose with me. And I had to let go. The hand railing was hot enough that it mm. burned through my gloves. Uh, it was kind of a weird deal. I, had, I could feel the handrail like the, the burn for, I don't know, six, eight hours afterwards, even though I didn't have any marks on there. So it was kind of wild. Hmm. But we get in, uh, vibe alerts start going off. I'm not sure how long it's going to take us to get back out. We start going down. Another crew comes in, goes up right behind us. They end up leaving the hand line and going in and making a grab on this kid. Unfortunately, uh, he, he did not survive. Um, but guys did a whole bunch of right things mm-hmm. that day. Of course, there's a whole bunch of things that we would do differently. Uh, a super good friend of mine was the acting assistant chief. He was a captain AC role. It was right at shift change. So he was in there Always. early <laughs> and he's looking at this place and he's thinking, Hey, we need to go defensive. We've chatted about it lots. Hey, we need to go defensive. But he knew that we were trying to get in there and do what all of us want to do, which is fire tech and just make a grab on this kid. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's one of the, the real big ones. Um, I still use that as reference on lots of things. There's a reason I'm passionate about hose line deployment and advancement is because, hey, guess what? We're probably doing that at every single fire because, mm-hmm. you know, we need to spray water. Yeah, you're a big so, engine guy. Yeah, I, I like the engine stuff. Not saying any of that other stuff is not important, but that's I, I love that part of it. So, of course, I take that fire and I'm like, how could we make it to where we could move further, faster, easier? We're not burning up as much air. Well, hey, let's let's throw another company at that line and see if we can do it. Hey, let's drill uh, – drill dry can we drill on the playground can we do all these different things Mm -hmm. to make it to where 
pushing lines easy. So, and it, it's never going to be as easy as it is on the training ground. But if we have that as a starting point, I think things go uh, pretty pretty smooth. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of good learning points at that one. Yeah. Any other fires? Um, we uh, yeah there there was uh, it would have been maybe two years ago we had an uh, apartment fire, and crews that showed up on location it was uh full fire alarm dispatch we knew that there was a fire we had cameras pulled up it was close to an intersection so dispatch is watching the fire progress as we're en route and it was uh out on the east side of town the furthest I've, yeah I, I call it east station six engine 61 medic six are out there they've got pretty much a straight shot to that fire we know they're we know it's rolling they show up uh captain does an awesome job saying hey we're gonna hit it with a deck gun and Fairly close to that, we'd been doing some some training on apartment fires with uh, Chris Langlois, who's now out on the East Coast, but he was from Omaha. And it was like, hey, fast water, so let's let's pull up, let's dump a bunch of water on this thing, let's get crews to the, the top floor as fast as possible, make sure that we don't have fire spread into the attic and everything else. This fire started on, I believe it was the main level, level one, worked its way up on the outside, got into the attic, and... While we saved the structure, ultimately it did get into the attic, all kinds of damage. They end up tearing the whole building down. But crews did an awesome job. Hey, they got there, uh, hit it with a deck gun, then took lines inside. Sprinkler building, we still technically, I say we saved it, but it was really kind of a loss, you know, just because of the damage. But it was interesting talking to the guys afterwards, this whole concept of timing things and videoing and everything else. Uh, firefighter on that rig, he hit me up afterwards. He's like, hey, I did, when we pulled up, I did X. I didn't have the greatest shot on the, with the deck gun. So I went over. And then as I adjusted, I was low. And it took me two different times before I got it in there where I wanted it. Still did a phenomenal job. But if, we, if you take what we're doing as far as timing it, everything matters, everything's important. Like a little bit of practice is what he wanted me to share with guys so that we could, of course, grow from that. Sure. Um, we run a minute man hose load. It's for the most part, one directional. So, for example, uh, cross lay that's on the front comes off the firefighter uh, captain side. Second cross lay comes off the the uh, driver side. Yep. You can pull them both ways. So, this side, this one, the captain and uh, captain side was towards the alpha side of the structure. So we had to pull the line through. And again, it just takes a little bit of practice, and you can deploy that line different ways. You just have to think about it before you go to do it. Because if you're not paying attention, you go to take yeah. off, cross leg gives you problems or yeah. whatever else the case may be. So a lot of learning points from that one on uh, hitting with the deck gun, getting lines to the top floor. Do we take charge, uncharge lines? Um, interesting thing, getting to the uh, getting to the roof, make a trench cut, trying to get up there, size that up, do everything right. Hey, do we attempt to get up a 35 foot 35 footer with equipment in our hands or do we just take a rope bag, throw it down, hoist it up? So all kinds of little things uh, come from that. We did a class afterwards with the guy that was on the roof, uh, a side event group, and myself measuring things out, taking dry lines in there, trying to see where we could actually make it to. Uh, this was roughly from the rig to the front door was 75-ish feet, and we wanted to see how far our 200-foot cross lace could get up to the top level, which they could. Um, uh, another little thing that came out of that was instead of taking pike poles, hey, let's take New York cooks mm. uh, because of the flex. Hey, we've got yeah, double sheet of drywall okay. in there. So, hey, that double sheet of drywall is going to be a little more challenging to breach if I've got a pike pole. So, hey, let me get something that's a little more sturdy. I don't want to take too long of a pike pole because then it's going to be super challenging to manipulate in an 8 to 10-foot mm -hmm. yep. uh, space there. So lots of little things that came from that, and it was just kind of cool to get feedback from guys and uh, just, again, continue to grow. Ultimately – I think everybody when they get on the fire department nobody signs up to be like i'm i'm here to be a turd it's like my, yeah. my career ambition everybody wants to do well so yeah. hearing, going to those fire scenes talk, hearing you talk i can hear it i can also hear what your passion is for training and improvement how can we always be doing stuff better how can we humble ourselves and be like that was good we can still be better and i think yeah. that's, that's what i love to hear yeah no, i appreciate that that's that's why i i, I want that to come across because i'm not trying to beat dudes up I just want them to. I want them to. Kick well, when ass. one of us gets better, it makes everyone better because yep. it makes everyone's job easier, or they don't have to worry about the job you're doing. Right. Yeah. I don't want to have to worry about what Ben's doing on a fire because I know Ben can do his job and I can work on what I'm working. Totally. We're working together, but doing separate things probably most of the time. Yeah. Well, but we all depend on other people. 
Yeah. You know, we're not a one man team. Well, that's what you get. You get better, learn a different method, or just train someone. They'd be like, "Hey, you know, I've been I've been working on this, and I found like if we, if you just do this instead of this, it makes it so much easier and faster." Mm -hmm. And then you share that to the next guy, who's like, "Oh yeah, that's way better." And then you know, then all of a sudden, the efficiency and everything, it just builds from one to the next to the next. I think the big thing is having that culture. Yeah. Which is which is tough, and and uh, I was just looking to some podcasts. I can't remember exactly who said it, but hey, hey, culture is coming from the bottom and working its way up. So. I've got guys that, you know, hit me up. Oh, man, hey, my crew doesn't do X. I'm like, hey, man, check it out. Like, do you want to do X? Yeah, I want to do X. I say, cool. Hey, create your own culture. Yeah. So if you want that, then you need to get there and make sure that the rig is the way that you want it to be and make sure everything's good to go. And then, hey, maybe if you're lucky, you get to snag one other guy. And then that's just going to spread. And eventually, you're going to find yourself in a spot that is a little more uh, – you got a little more exposure to other other people. Yeah. One, that's one thing that's super awesome about the training division – you're siloed a little bit if you're on shift. You're siloed a little bit if you're in a one company station. Train division, I'm exposed to all these different people. So I get to hear from them what works well, what doesn't work well, what, mm-hmm. what we need to tweak and, and kind of go from from there. Just in general, when it comes to leadership, do you have any leadership philosophies and or influences that you've built throughout your career? Uh, I'm a student of every game to include the leadership thing. So I can, I mean, I can think back to certain things that were said and done way back when I first joined the Army at, at the 509th. Um, I've always had a strong desire to figure out how guys work well under pressure and drawn from that. And that goes, I listen to all sorts of different podcasts. I'm, I'm always trying to read a book. Um, there's a, a, a quote I love, hey, create good habits to become their slave, some, something along those lines. Mm-hmm. And that's in everything, hey, we should all be working out, we should be drinking plenty of water, you know, yada, 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 all those things. Um, leadership thing, there's different, different, definite difference between leadership and management and understanding the difference. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, maybe we're leading at the station, but we're managed on the fire scene. You know, so just tweaking those things and, and perspective a little bit there. Uh, again, I'll go back to, hey, I should be a student of that game and try to find anything and everything that I can on that. And then you, you got to you gotta practice it and see what works well and what doesn't, and then constantly evaluate it. Yeah, I, yeah. I see uh, here you, you've written, no bad teams, only bad leaders. I believe that's Jocko. Yep. Um, big Jocko fan. Anything from yeah. him? What, what, what from him do you really like? So lucky in the sense, uh, very first academy, uh, super good buddy. He helped me with the academy. It was like, hey, boom, here's your academy. So I was started at the, in the training division in May of 17, and in June of 17, we started our own recruit class. Well, we knock this, we do something, we're trying to figure out how we can give these guys a little bit of leadership up front, right? So it goes back to, hey, you've been here an hour, he's been here two, he's in charge, yada, yada. I wanted to give that to the guys in the academy. So we did, uh, we can call it book club, okay? Oh, so yeah, we, did, we did a book club with our academy. Every Friday, we'd sit down, we had a chapter that was assigned that week, they had to read it, it was from Extreme Ownership. They would read that, we would discuss it, we would try to take what was in that chapter and apply it to um, the fire service. Right, and that that was set up by two of us, and then we had an assistant chief kind of buy off on the concept. He wanted to do it department wide, so we ended up rolling that same concept out to the entire department. Uh, met with mixed results. Some guys are like, "Hey, is there a fire service book that we could be reading?" I'm like, "Yeah, this is just the one that we chose." Uh, there's a lot of great things in that book. I've listened to a whole bunch of Jocko podcasts. I've mm-hmm. uh, been to a, a muster, and wow, the the things you can take from that book are huge. You know, uh, I can't remember the exact exact quote or whatever it is that it comes from, but he talks about looking through his red dot scope. I believe it was Leif looking through his red dot scope, and this is now your. That's all you can take in is what you see right through here. So you got to come off that a little bit and take a look around. And it's the same thing as when you step off the rig. Hey, if you get task saturated or fixated on one specific thing, like you're not probably not being the best manager. Mm-hmm. Being a great worker, but how well right. are we managing the fire scene? So there's lots of good things there. Uh, no, no bad teams, only bad leaders. That can be a little rough because we know that there are some dudes that maybe make it challenging yeah, to be on their Nebraska team. Nebraska Cornhuskers are a bad team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have Nebraska fans in here? I'm a Nebraska fan, but um, anyways. <laughs> 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 the... Uh, 
it, it's it's just one of those deals like hey a good leader can get in there and make some things happen and there's a whole bunch of different ways to make sure that it gets done mm-hmm. um, I love Jocko's book I think it's great pull lots of stuff from it yeah, his, his stuff on like having that extreme ownership I think is fantastic yeah. you know and stuff with that you know if you if you you know if you make a mistake or if it's you know whose responsibility is to, is to not pass the buck on anybody else Be right like, no I it's yeah I, I'm, I'm I did it you know or I'm owning it or it's my fault it's my responsibility because whether I didn't I didn't train you good enough I didn't tr- I didn't set my expectations I didn't you know even if, even if you know ship if even if he messed up on something it's because that yeah I didn't you know I I failed him as a leader because I didn't prepare him for what needed to be right. done and stuff it's yeah. not you know his, his yeah. stuff on that is fantastic dealing it, with you know. dealing with ego and yeah all yeah. that he covers it's it's lot. challenging yeah. right because yeah. like if if I'm teaching a class and somebody continues to mess it up, really what I should do is take some self reflection and figure mm-hmm. out is it, are my goals clear? Is the words that I'm using uh, direct to the point, etc. And it, it's goofy. I, I can think about one specific academy where I, there was a guy that was kind of hovering towards the the back of the pack, routinely. Multiple people are saying it, and I had said, "Hey, move the purpose like a fire ground pace. Like we should be hauling ass. We're here to do a job, etc." I said that over and over and over again. Finally, I'm like, maybe this dude doesn't know that I'm talking to him. So I'm like, hey, Ben. So I, I was kind of a joke. I'd like grab dudes. I'm like, mm-hmm. let's go for a walk, which really wouldn't pick up trash. But I'd, we'd chat about something. I'm like, hey, man, do you realize that when I say move with a purpose that I am specifically talking to you? And he's like, no, you are? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, dude. Like, if you can read everybody's coat in front of you, guess what? You're the last one. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. move with a purpose. You, I am specifically talking to you. I'm just directing the entire crowd, okay? Because I don't want to single you out. But obviously, I had to single you out. Yeah. And he, I don't think he took offense to it. But I'll tell you what, from that moment forward, he wasn't the last guy in the pack. And now that dude is, with a doubt, one of the most loved guys on the on the fire ground. Because he is a good dude. Um, I'm not saying I had anything to do with it. All I did was say, hey, it was it was on me. It was my fault. I mm. wasn't grabbing that guy and saying. Right. And why, you know, or, or a guy that's just not getting it. Well, but maybe you have to take it upon yourself. Be like, this whole class is getting it. Why does this guy do it? You, you know, and you said you take self-reflection. Well, I, I said, you know, this, this, and everybody else is getting it. Why can't, is it the guy is the problem? Or maybe that guy, again, yeah, you go to him and say, hey, what, you know, what am I not doing that you need? Like right. Maybe you, maybe they learn different. Maybe they interpret things different. Maybe they just can't grasp something and they just need something that turns that switch or whatever, you know. And yeah. like I said, I think you did that good thing with that, with that guy and said, hey, I, I'm, I'm talking to you and you just made him aware of it and all of a sudden he's like oh now i get it you yeah. know so sometimes it's just people just they they might learn different than everybody else and yeah. you just have to instead of writing that guy off approach him and just talk to him and just ask him and especially off to the side nobody n- nobody likes getting called out in front of a whole group of people nope. or being singled out because that nope. shuts somebody down so fast right yeah. um to do that but to like you know that that but it, it becomes that mentoring that just that conversation and be like Hey, I care about you. I want you to do better. I need to know what you need from me. What am I not giving you mm. that you need? Right? Yeah. I love it. You know, I love it. I, I think taking that to the fire station, like, I don't know what's going on every moment in that guy's life. We know that there's all sorts of things going on that people are embarrassed to share. They don't want to burden us, whatever else the case may be. The brotherhood should be, hey, I'm going to, how can I help you? Mm-hmm. What, what can I do to make your life better yeah. and sometimes we lose that a little bit you know we're, yeah. we're quick to uh criticize mm-hmm. and we we need to kind of take that stuff in and not let it out Definitely. to uh, other yeah. dudes other than the rather than doing the man that guy's a turd yeah yeah we're telling everyone man you should have seen this guy on this fire the other day i don't know what the hell he's thinking what yeah. he's doing what's his officer well, doing exactly you, you don't know how about approach thinking. the you guy don't know what the officer is yeah. thinking you know you know you don't know what's going how on about help him out instead of yeah. tearing him down behind his back you know like right. yep. we're our yeah. own worst enemies on a lot we of are. things absolutely and i think that that's a that's one to think about yeah. too yep. it's a pretty shitty brotherhood if yes all you do i don't want to call it a brotherhood if that's the way it's yeah. going to be yeah. but it is a damn brotherhood so we do need to do this better you know about I want you to mentor me. I want you to hold me accountable. I want you to help me get better. And if I said something that was goofy, hey, redirect me. If 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 my skills are off a little bit, then help me out. Because the last thing I want to do is is be a blister. Last thing I want to do is be. Mm -hmm. I want to pull my weight and then summon. If everybody's doing that, nobody has to work at a hundred percent all the time. You don't have to be a dick about it. You know, you don't have to go. 
hey, you suck at this. Right. Get right. better. No. Hey, uh, can I help you do a, you know, can I help you do a ladder throw or something later? Yeah. yeah. You don't have to be blatantly no. just a dick about it, you know? Because no. like Cap said, that's going to shut someone down faster than anything, yeah. right? Yeah. Or maybe you say something like that and the guy goes, no, I don't want to do that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now I know where you stand. Okay. Yeah. Never yeah. mind. Which then goes back then to what it, we chatted yeah, about earlier. What we like, just talked about. <laughs> all right, bro. Well, I got to break it down for you. Yeah. Uh, so. Right. All good, good stuff. stuff yeah. Anything yeah. else? Uh, leadership uh, calls before I'll, I'll let you talk about your family at the end here. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to touch on? No, I mean, uh, you kind of see what my mindset is on a lot of that stuff, and then trying to pull stuff from every single call, even the most mundane th- mundane things we can learn from. That uh, you know, God forbid that worst case scenario where we have a vehicle come through come through the accident scene and take dudes out. Yeah. Like really, all we're doing then is I'm um, hitting play on my playlist and I can roll through that stuff uh hopefully off my tongue that is clear yeah, to perfect. the point or I'm not working that day and that's the crew that's showing up to my kids daycare yeah yeah so I better help that crew out if I see some, or I better say something if I notice man maybe we should brush up more on this training or you know remind ourselves I need to brush up on that training or myself but yeah yeah we're all here to help each other and help the community so right we're all here to get better mm-hmm. totally. humbleness very important very very important um let's talk about your family your wife heather gets married 23 years yep um i met my wife in eighth grade and uh that was uh southern iowa and then i moved back to cal i I moved back to iowa went to school a little bit uh then i moved back to california and then i so i met her in eighth grade i came back saw her a couple times weren't dating or anything and then i was in the army she was going to school we uh ran into each other at a wedding, uh, were together for a little while, went our separate ways, and then uh, shortly after I got out of the Army, we hooked up again. We've been together for, uh, well, married 23 years here in June, uh, together for a little bit over that. Uh, super supportive, makes um, makes being at the fire department easy mm, because I can go to the fire department. I, have to worry, I don't have to worry about things getting done at home. She just does it which is cool phenomenal same thing hey uh i'm gone for four months to kuwait she's got it all scored away and then some i get uh, a three-week uh beach trip to guam on the air force's <laughs> dime a couple times uh and it's you know january february here guess what hey she's got everything done i don't i i can i can turn it off and focus on the mission which is which is huge so super beyond appreciative and grateful of her and all that she does and everything else. And hey, guess what? She has to tolerate the fire department and uh, you guys know how that can be sometimes. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. So being able to do what she does on the on the fire department side, on the military side, and then of course, like I said, hey, I'm, I'm a volunteer firefighter. I, yeah. I do the reserve deputy thing. I've got my own business. I'm doing lots and for some reason she she tolerates that. She keeps uh, hanging around very with well. you. Yeah. yeah. Well, did she it's, come uh, from a family with military and fire or fire in the background any of that nope uh her her dad was in the military um vietnam era uh air force Mm -hmm. and but otherwise no she she didn't so she she's just super strong faith you know somehow i got that too i don't know what i did yeah yeah, i did a lot to not line myself up for that but i got it too so i'm I'm just wondering you know yeah no it's it's, uh it's just it's uh beyond blessed Mm -hmm. with what all she does and how she does it and everything else. And then we've got two boys, Jack on Wichita, medic in the uh, Iowa Army National Guard. Sam, sixteen. He's uh, he is, I say, borderline freak athlete. Freshman, he letters in uh, football. Uh, well, I must have got that from his mom then. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> cool. Yeah, definitely. Um, she's uh, or he he's awesome on the football side. Big on the track side. Phenomenal shooter. It's it's funny. Cool. He, what's what's cool about him and his athleticism is when we go to shooting competitions, him and I can battle each other a little bit, which is wild that a 16 year old is shooting with a dude that's in his late forties, but it's because he has talent and we've debriefed all those things and sure. do lots of stuff. So, and they're all, uh, hard workers do, you know, they're active, awesome. do all that good stuff. So we've got, uh, two dogs. I want to say like 50 cats and that's probably <laughs> not an exaggeration. I live on a, I live out in the sticks, uh, roughly 10 miles from council bluffs. We moved out there, and there's like, hey, we're going to get, like, five cats. I'm like, five cats seems crazy. And she said, don't worry. 
they'll all be dead in like six months because <laughs> the coyotes are going to eat them. Oh. And while we've lost some, these it was like gremlins. You poured water on them, and these things just <laughs> <laughs> went, went like crazy. Oh, and then we've got 12 or 13 chickens. So oh, nice. Uh, nice. I so will would... trade eggs for gold if you, oh, uh, yeah, you know, uh, you guys, Baker, they're worth that. Do you and so Baker I'll share uh, uh, chicken stories to give each other tips back and forth as far as no, but we, chicken stuff? We might have to. I don't no. know. <laughs> I don't want to know what Baker does with chickens. Um, I could have a couple guesses, but yeah. <laughs> um, did she grow up in the sticks then, or anything so like that? Or she grew up a little rural, but I mean, just you know, an acreage, yep. two to four acres outside of town. Uh, it's funny. We lived in town in Council Bluffs, and when I found this place that we currently live at, she's like, ah, I don't, I don't know if I really want to move out in the country because you know, when she grew up there, it was always a pain to get into town and everything sure, else. Absolutely. But, now it's like, and we've got 10 acres, a little bit of rolling hills, incredible views, big, huge front porch, chickens, cats, dogs. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. This it's, is like where I'm going to be probably in 20 years. I'm just <laughs> listening to it. Yeah, yeah it's, it's uh, and she's all about where we live. It works great. And we're close enough to town, you know, perfect. 10, 15 yep. minutes you're there, mm-hmm. yet you're far enough away that it's it's uh, yeah. no big deal. So awesome. she, I don't know where she gets like, she's a, she's a pet lover and so you know she's taking stitches out of cats that get torn up by other cats and Mm -hmm. she's researching all this stuff she needs to do for chickens and why they're not laying eggs the way she wants them to and everything else so and and she she does all that and works full-time so it's uh it's wow it's pretty uh pretty wild place out at our house uh still pretty young yet so he's a freshman but your other kid sam any idea what he's what, what waits for him after high school so not sure. He's uh, he said he doesn't want to play football, but I'm like, dude, if you could play football somewhere, why wouldn't you play football somewhere? Oh, yeah, sure. And yeah. and he's uh, he's a scrapper. He's he's not as tall as I am, so I'm like six two, six three. My wife's four eleven. Oh. My boys are somewhere in the middle there, which means a little on the sh- on shorter than me. Um, he's an animal. He love he's super fast. He loves taking hits. Uh, he loves hitting dudes. Mm-hmm. So. We'll see where it goes after that. He's he's expressed interest in the military side, but the kid's also a builder. So he loves doing stuff in wood shop. He's all cool. about welding stuff. Uh, so you never know. Like the trades could yeah, be something he'd trades, be all about. Man, that's awesome. Like yeah. anymore right, now, right. you, you could get places. Forgotten arts. Yeah, yeah, you could get school paid for to go into any of that yep. stuff. And yeah, that's so the he, ticket. Anymore. Super creative in that regard. And uh, it's it's weird. Why I was I was thinking like what all the things he's done. And he's always grabbed stuff and tinkered with it. Whether yeah. it was. Uh, grabbing a, a pistol frame and stippling it to give it a different oh, texture sweet. or making nice. fishing, you know, fishing pole holders or whatever else the case may be, rigging up our kayak so that he can get all of his fishing poles on the back. Uh, he's a he's a little bit of an artist. Yeah. Cool. So, so very it cool. sounds like yeah. both your kids have passion, motivation for stuff. Uh, you think that came pretty natural for them, or is there something you did along the way? I'm thinking someone had that. a little something to do with that. <laughs> but. Uh, I mean, I would like to say – that's always been there, but of course, you know, kind of like, hey, leaders born or made, and I would say, hey, a little bit of both, right? Mm-hmm. So sure. I would say they definitely had it. Um, Just took the right measuring, yeah, uh, right? Both my wife and I are super encouraging. Good. Pretty much anything they wanted to be involved in, we helped them with that, and then uh, would, you know, push them in the right direction, get them going so mm-hmm. that they could do do things as high awesome. as level as they wanted to. Good for them. Yeah. That's well, awesome. To Jack, put in a little word now that we got a plug to Wichita. Yeah, maybe. Huh? Wichita. You guys up. get, you guys have done training from. Have you done training from that uh, Isaac Fraser's company from down there? Yeah, so at we, Council Bluffs. Right? Yep, we've had Isaac up, up uh, two, maybe three times. Just, okay. just work um, vehicle extrication stuff. Right on. So what, what, we have an awesome relationship. We're super blessed on Council Bluffs. We call Alters, which is the local scrap yard, and say, hey guys can you hook us up and they'll cool. say yeah what do you need we'll say we need 30 cars at our training center they call the local tow company tow company takes care of us they'll bring all those cars to the training facility we'll sit down there and Great. cut up cars so yeah isaac's come up and done a handful of classes cool. very uh, influential as far as what we do and how we do it but we've also sent guys to end of the job down yep. there for uh, uh wearing my end of the job bracelet yeah. today because we talked about it a little yeah and so it's you know that'll be coming up this year yep so awesome place to go to yeah. and then of course wichita hot we've sent guys to it and we were chatting about that mm-hmm. last time um awesome, cool. awesome place to go I, I know hey all three of those things great place to go for training 
Um, FTTN, I know we chatted about that briefly the other day out of, out of Indy. FTIC is right. going on yep. right now. And yep. mm-hmm. FTIC FTN is a uh, phenomenal location with Jim McCormick out there. We try to send guys there a uh, handful of times a year. Very we cool. we got guys going there in, in May and June. Very cool. So, yeah. Good deal. Awesome. Well, as we wrap it up here, um, any advice to new firefighters? That will be, be one of the last questions I ask you. Um, you know, I th- I, it goes back to what I'm going to really tell, you know, the guys that are trying to get on the department or guys that are on, already on the department. It's, it's, it's kind of universally applied to everybody. They should be seeking out education experience from every single thing they can get. So, hey, if that means, you know, if they're not from Council Bluffs, say, drive to, drive to work a little bit early, take a couple laps around town so you can figure out where things are. Mm-hmm. Um, make sure you articulate what it is that you want to do to the guys above you so that you can get some of the education expertise from them. Uh, experience, hey, take a couple extra overtime shifts. Not only overtime shifts, but hey, maybe do some special event stuff so you can see what's going on in the community from those regards. Cool. Uh, goes create good habits to become their slave. If you buy off on the concept that education experience matters, that should really never die. It should just maybe tweak a little bit throughout, not only when you trying to get hired, but when you get hired post-academy, all the way up through the promotion, and then, hey, when you retire, you should figure out some way to keep getting education experience so you don't mm-hmm. sit down in an easy chair and just kick the bucket. Well, it keeps so, you sharp between the ears. Totally, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Well, that's that's how I would stimulate the brain there, yeah. That's, that's good. We, we've been asking that. a lot of our, at least, at least the fire guests, we ask that, that question too. So hopefully we're making a compilation of good advice for yeah. Yeah. anyone and everyone. But uh, Phil? Co- um, a compilation? Compilation. Is that? No? I didn't think so. I only I only hosted for one uh, of these episodes, but I feel like mine went way better than. <laughs> <laughs> Probably did. You guys did a great job. Just I'm just kidding, compiling. Sorry. Wait, welcome yeah. back, man. And, and thank you to Dusty Johnson for filling in too. Yeah, you did it. Awesome. Yeah, that was fun was to okay. listen on the other side of things. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. Yeah. Oh, um, you don't know how much fun we had without you. Here, so <laughs> it was. I could hear it. Yeah. <laughs> no, but no, yeah, we do have a uh, big thing coming up. It's it's the first time. Uh, that we've done this. So part of our strategic plan uh, and strategic initiative for the department stuff was to do a lot more reaching out for the retirees uh, and to get in touch with them and stuff. So we're going to do, we're doing our first ever uh, retiree breakfast on uh, May 13th. And then we're going to do another one in the fall. Uh, So all the retirees should have gotten a mailer that got sent out um, and they're supposed to RSVP to Jen. So they all know who Jen is and they can get a hold of her. And then uh, the day of, if anybody's looking to help with, uh, you know, whether it's retirees I want to help out or even our guys and stuff to kind of help out, you reach out to to Baker, to Ryan Baker. You guys can have his contact info and stuff. But it should be a pretty cool event. You know, I've already talked to a couple of different retirees and stuff that they seem excited about it. Also, if any retirees listening to this, they do or somebody that knows somebody that you know we also sent out another message that um because that was something that was communicated is that maybe some of these guys are you know some of the older ones and stuff can't drive anymore and they we'd hate to have the only reason they can't go to this breakfast or this event because they can't uh can't drive there so we will we will get to contact jen again um we'll make sure you get a ride so you can mm-hmm. get a ride there and back so you can go but it, it sounds like um there's a lot of interest the guys are excited about it That'll be fun. um yeah, i think it'll be really cool we had uh we had a, a retiree dr- bring a bunch of stuff one of my last shifts at shifts at fours and brought a bunch of stuff that he had from the from the old union and and uh just old pictures of going through this the stuff and he was like pretty excited but i mean it's awesome it's, it's gonna be a cool thing i think i think guys uh, uh, are gonna be into it it's gonna be a good event to to keep going it's, yeah we they didn't them. they didn't have something like this so now rob you're gonna have this locked in time forever basically you know for your, whether your kids want to listen yeah. to it grandkids yeah. you know we're archiving this stuff for yeah it's going to be on the internet so once it once it ends up there it's there yeah. forever once yeah, you form yeah. another so, so it'll be that, that's you know. huge i, I, I yeah. love the the concept of hey, either writing books or yeah. you know jot it down in a journal or, or doing this uh, and i'm on a truck so i can't write i can't or read, read really so this is perfect for me can you know, can, rock he like could barely sharp, color uh, inside uh, the lines uh, uh, barely. Uh, uh, <laughs> the, the retiree it. thing is huge i mean those guys leave and you lost all that if you yeah. don't have some way to capture it. Yes. So the retiree yeah. breakfast, we yep. do a handful of those a year. We also do like an annual fish fry. Awesome. I mean, it's great to yeah. get them old dudes together. They have like a monthly meeting where they just link up yep. and you can go, you know, they'd love to see young guys, but then you want to sure. talk about 
growing, like, hey, pick their brains on what they did. No kidding. Nozzles man. there running, hose there yeah. running, how yeah. they did things. Yeah, well, it's, and, it's, it's and we do. Cool. We have the smoker every year, you know, the union smoker and stuff. Mm-hmm. And they, you know, and I know there's some of the coffee groups, the small informal mm-hmm. kind of coffee groups. So this will be the first one where you really have more of a formal event, but yet a formal event that's still informal. You yeah. know, just kind of breakfast. But I think, yeah, I think it'd be pretty cool just to, you know, and then see guys. But it is a good connection. for, And it's for them, too, because to know that, you know, the department didn't completely forget about you. You put in 30 years on the job, you know, and to just be like, well, okay, that's my last shift. I walk out the door and that's it. You know, it's yeah. kind of, it's a big part of your life because a third of those 30 years were spent in the firehouse. or right. you know, And, I mean, it's, it's, it is a big part. So to know that, you know, at least the department, you, you're not forgotten. And then there's guys that... You know, you were you were in a guy spot, you know, in the 1950s or whatever. That's you know, as a new guy, and now here you got another a new guy in 2023 that you can share. You know, what kind of knowledge, what the department was like, and it helps us to keep you know, as guys have been on the job too now that to to remember what it was like and to just get some of those things that that you forget, you know. But then, I don't know. It's just I I think it's always cool when you got guys got that that have been retired for 20 years before I came on the job. Um, you know, and then you talk to them and stuff, and you're like, man, you know, what it was like back in the day, you know. But then there's still things like you talk to them, and it's still the same kind of arguments and discussions. And, this, you know, the same, <laughs> yeah, a lot of the same change. problems that we, we, they had, you know, back in the 50s and 60s and even 70s and stuff that we, that we still talk about today. Yeah. And it's like, you know, and the, the, you know, the face and the names might change, but the people don't, you know. It's kind of, <laughs> the, you know, really, you know. So it's, 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 it's really, kind of a cool Another thing. thing that comes out of that's really cool, uh, you know, uh, firefighter passes or whatever the case may be, uh, you link up with family and it's pretty cool to connect those, those names that you've heard, like, like so-and-so being an awesome cook or whatever. And you're like, Hey, Oh, Hey, my grandpa was on the fire department. Oh yeah. Who's your grandpa? Uh, such and such dude. I've heard of that guy. He was, yeah, yeah he was yeah. a nut, whatever the case may be. Yep. People, people <laughs> like to hear that. Yeah. And, um, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. You, you can't do it if you don't link no, up. No, and that extends, yeah, for the family to extend, like, to know that, well, yeah, their their family member, their loved one, there was kind of, there is still kind of a little bit of a legacy, but that guys, that people that they've never met mm-hmm. have still knew, yeah, you know, their dad or whoever, their grandpa or their uncle or who's, you know, so this family's like, oh, you know, this means a little bit more because he wasn't just, they know him from his family life but you know we know might know them from from the fire service or at least the stories or whatever but that right. lives on that helps that family because mm-hmm. to know that their family member is always living on outside even their family some way you know it's yeah. kind of i you you see that we we see, had that um being on the honor guard for the department and stuff and going and doing uh services and stuff and then mm-hmm. the firefighter funerals and then having people you know what the honor guard means to have that there um, but then also to talk to, you know, some people and stuff and, and be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I worked with them a little bit. Or, you know, I remember the stories that, you know, we're always told. It's, yeah, it's, yeah it is a thing. We're, we're hoping to have some retirees on, on this here real soon. Cool. So That'd be awesome. Maybe May. Yeah. That'll be a good platform to talk to some guys and see what they'd be interested in telling. Or maybe hear a few stories. Like, oh, we got to get yeah. that one on. Yeah. That'd so. be awesome. Really cool stuff. Rob, thank you so much for, you know, making the drive up today, being here with us. Yeah. Uh, if you ever make it up to Baker's Acres. We'll have to come over and have a cigar or play some paintball. I like it. Oh, yeah. yeah. We should, you should, yeah, make the trek up. And what is it, May? It's coming May 18th. May 18th, World yeah. War. World Do we War all get a shoot? That's World oh, yeah. War. Is, that is, it, is, it, is it three plus one now or four plus one? Four plus one? Somewhere like that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Somewhere in there. Yeah. But yeah, you should come up. You should we do a bunch a of different, time. like, capture the flag or uh, just. Assault on each other's hold, uh, holdings and stuff. Yeah. It's fun. Tie like bend to yeah. a tree and just you know send it. Yeah. yeah. No, you should jump for that. It's a good time. It really. Keep is. your head low, baby. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks again, Rob. Heck yeah. Appreciate, Appreciate you guys having me. Thank you, me Kevin, absolutely. for coming up. Let me chat about CB. So good you guys deal. doing it's awesome. awesome. Thank yeah. you. So, Love the relationship we got going and continue on. Right. Yeah. Perfect. Definitely. Ryan, go ahead and drop the tones for me. Drop them. <laughs>
What was that? Bring it in. My bad. My bad. This your good ear? Yeah. This your good ear? Catch the ball. Okay, gotcha. Omaha! Omaha! Blue 42! Set! Hey. That was done, goat.